John, we're live. I'm just double checking it. Thank you. All right. Good morning, everyone. If uh, Sergeant Adams could please start the recordings. Computer started. Thank you. Recording to the cloud. Thank you. Backup is rolling. Thank you. And good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing for the Committee on Health, jointly with the Committee on Hospitals. At this time, would all panelists please turn on their video for verification purposes. To minimize disruptions, we ask you to please place all electronic devices to vibrate or silent mode. If you'd like to submit testimony, please send via email to testimony at council.nyc.gov. Again, that is testimony at council.myc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation, Chair Levine and Chair Rivera. We are ready to begin. Thank you so much, Sergeant. We're gonna get started. I am Mark Levine, Chair of the City Council's Health Committee. I'm thrilled to be co-chairing today's hearing with Chair Carlina Rivera, and also very happy that we are joined by Speaker of the City Council, Corey Johnson. And if you are ready, Mr. Speaker, I'd love to cue you for an opening statement. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Good morning. Thank you all for being here today. And thanks to Chairs Levine and Rivera for holding this important hearing. They've both done incredible work throughout the pandemic to provide oversight over the administration's efforts to reduce the spread of COVID-19. Councilmember Levine pushed for racial disparity data on the disease and science-based decisions and Councilmember Rivera helped secure an additional $9 million for community-based vaccine education in the city's budget. They have both worked tirelessly to help New Yorkers navigate this crisis, and I'm incredibly proud of both of them and grateful to both of them. This is the council's, I believe, fourth hearing on the city's vaccination efforts, and we have passed two pieces of legislation to increase access to vaccines including a plan to provide vaccines to homebound seniors. Council members are also working closely with community groups to help overcome vaccine hesitancy. We have made good progress on vaccination rates over the last few weeks, and I'm pleased to see that the city's vaccination numbers have been trending up. Citywide, 70% of New Yorkers have received at least one dose of a vaccine. I strongly support the mayor's vaccine requirements and the key to the city program. It is the right thing to do from a public health perspective, and we're proving to the rest of the country that mandates work, but we have got a ways to go. As everyone knows, the Delta variant has taught us that we can't take our foot off the gas. Until we reach herd immunity through vaccinations, we'll continue to live with the specter of future outbreaks, possible restrictions, and a further delay in returning to what normal was before the pandemic. And we have a real problem with vaccine hesitancy. We're seeing discrepancies across geographic, racial, political, and even professional lines. The city's workforce itself is seeing massive differences in vaccination rates. Overall, only 65% of city workers had received at least one dose of the vaccine. 92% of the staff at the Conflicts of Inter Interest Board, COIB, are vaccinated. But for the Department of Sanitation, the rate is only 44%. The rates for first responders are particularly concerning. Just 57% of the FDNY is vaccinated and only 53% of the NYPD is vaccinated. Getting these numbers up might be the most important task we have as a city. Our economy and the health and safety of New Yorkers depends on it. I know the administration has been working incredibly hard at this around the clock. So I really wanna thank folks in the administration that are here today. I know that we're gonna hear in a few minutes from our health commissioner, Dr. Dave Chokshi, and there are other folks. I know Dr. Andrew Wallach is here uh, from Health and Hospitals. Uh, I'm grateful to all of their uh, hard work. I know that we'll have some questions for you today. Uh, and I know that we have the same goal together, which is we want to make sure that we partner with you to make sure we can do anything we can to ease vaccine hesitancy. Uh, and I look forward to having this hearing today 
And I turn it back to you, uh, Chair Levine. Thank you so much, Speaker Johnson, for those remarks and for your leadership throughout this crisis. Really grateful for all you're doing. Again, I'm Mark Levine, Chair of the City Council's Committee on Health. Today, we're holding a, he a hearing on the critical issue of vaccine hesitancy and equity in New York City. We will also be hearing a bill today sponsored by our colleague, Council Member Rafael Salamanca, which would require the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene to waive the $40 fee for applicants requesting to amend a death certificate to list the cause of death as COVID-19 or health complications caused by COVID-19. On December 14th, 2020, nurse Sandra Lindsay became the first person in the United States to receive the COVID-19 vaccine in New York's LIJ Medical Center. The same day, New York City began phase 1A of vaccine distribution. Today, all individuals in New York City aged 12 and over are eligible to receive a COVID-19 vaccine. We have come a long way. Vaccines are readily available for anyone who would like one. And almost 75% of our adult population is now fully vaccinated. This level of vaccination is a significant achievement and puts us ahead of many other parts of the country. But in the age of Delta, it's not enough. That's why it remains critical that we reach those New Yorkers who are still unvaccinated so that they take the life-saving step of getting their shots. Those who remain unvaccinated cite a variety of reasons for their hesitation. Lack of trust in the healthcare system, a perception of low risk from disease, a desire to wait and see, concerns about the speed at which the vaccines were developed. We also understand that a long history of racism and neglect in the American medical system has led to lack of trust in the vaccine in communities of color, in particular among Black New Yorkers. These challenges have been exploited by a pernicious torrent of misinformation and outright lies online, which has fueled resistance to vaccines, often based on belief in wild conspiracy theories. So let's be clear. The COVID-19 vaccines are remarkably effective and safe. They dramatically improve your chances of avoiding serious illness, hospitalization, and death. And they are incredibly safe, as safe approximately as aspirin. And they have been scrutinized now to a degree that might exceed any vaccine in history with billions, billions of doses administered globally. So everyone can and should get this vaccine for their own sake, to protect their family, to protect their communities, and to protect New York City. The way to inform people about the facts of the COVID vaccines is not to humiliate them or shame them or demonize them. It is to patiently and respectfully listen to people's concerns and offer the facts. This is most effective when done by people with deep connections to and credibility with impacted communities. Community-based organizations or CBOs are uniquely suited for the work of overcoming hesitancy, thanks in part to their cultural and linguistic competence. We need to mobilize a huge network of these organizations to take on this critical work for the sake of equity and for the sake of the broader public health of our city. In the meantime, we have an obligation to minimize COVID risk by ensuring that people in sensitive professional sectors and public venues are vaccinated. The early results on this front in New York City make it clear that vaccine mandates do indeed work. I look forward to hearing from DOHMH about their equity action plan to advance vaccination in marginalized communities and how they're using population specific strategies to reach unvaccinated New Yorkers. I want to thank the entire team at the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene for what they have done over the past 19 months, working almost round the clock in the face of this pandemic. I'm incredibly grateful for your efforts and I re remain extremely proud of New York City's health department. And I also wanna thank my colleagues from the health committee for uh, being here today. So I want to acknowledge, uh, if I miss any, forgive me, uh, Council Member Alan Maisel, 
uh, council member, uh, I believe Keith Powers, uh, forgive me here. You know what, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm not seeing the whole list here, so I'm gonna come back after uh, Chair Rivera's remarks. Uh, wait, I, I do see it now, forgive me. Council member Dharma Diaz, um, council member Holden, council member Feliz, council member Brooks Powers. Um, and if I've missed any of you, forgive me, I'll come back to you in a moment. And now I would indeed, oh, forgive me, one last thing, I wanna thank the staff of the health committee who have worked incredibly hard throughout this pandemic and very hard to get ready for this hearing. Uh, a big, big shout out to Harbani Ahuja, one of our committee councils who really burned the midnight oil ahead of this hearing. Of course, our committee council, Sara Liss, for her continued incredible work. Uh, our wonderful policy analyst in Balkan and finance analyst, Lauren Hunt, who have done such great work throughout this pandemic. And now I would like to cue my co-chair in this hearing, uh, Carlina Rivera for her opening remarks. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. I'm council member Carlina Rivera, chair of the committee on hospitals. And we are all here today to discuss vaccine hesitancy and equity in New York City. It was not so long ago that the Committee on Hospitals, along with the Committee on Health, held hearings regarding the COVID-19 vaccine and its distribution and accessibility in New York City. At the time, there was a shortage of vaccines, and we were focused on ensuring that we were prioritizing New Yorkers who were most at risk and making the vaccine as accessible as possible for hard-to-reach New Yorkers. Now, just months later, we are again meeting to discuss vaccine equity, but from a different perspective. Our city now has more than enough vaccine supply to vaccinate all New Yorkers. Appointments are readily available at any number of locations and New Yorkers can even choose which vaccine they prefer and get vaccinated in their own homes. We have made significant progress. And for that, I also want to commend the city's health department and healthcare workers for their efforts in improving access to vaccinations for New Yorkers. Nevertheless, there is still more work to do. As of September 27th, 69.1% of New York residents of all ages had received at least one dose of a COVID vaccine, while 82% of adult New Yorkers had received at least one dose. However, some populations within the city have lower vaccination rates than others. For example, New Yorkers aged 85 years and older have the lowest vaccination rates of all age groups, with only 58% fully vaccinated. Similarly, Black New Yorkers have some of the lowest vaccination rates, with only 39% fully vaccinated. We know that for many communities of color, immigrant communities, and religious communities, Vaccine hesitancy has been attributed to a history of racist or discriminatory medical experimentation by the government, fostered by ongoing discrimination against people of color in the healthcare system and other barriers that limit access to healthcare. To be blunt, New York City is no exception. DOHMH has acknowledged that differences in health outcomes and vaccination coverage among racial and ethnic groups are due to long term structural racism. But vaccine hesitancy cannot simply be drawn along racial or ethnic lines. There are many other reasons for vaccine hesitancy, which we aim to uncover throughout this hearing. Today, we hope to hear from the administration about what these reasons are, how they are addressing vaccine hesitancy in New York City, and how they are engaging in public outreach and education to reach hard to reach communities. We look forward to hearing more about DOHMH's equity action plan and other methods the city is utilizing to address vaccine hesitancy and inequity. Thank you, of course, to the administration, to everyone who is present to testify today, to our speaker, Corey Johnson. I also wanna thank the hospital committee staff, Council Herbani Ahuja, policy analyst and Balkan, finance analyst, Lauren Hunt, data analyst Rachel Alexandrov, of course, my whole team, the sergeants and everyone else who made this hearing happen, and to everyone for giving time today to make sure that their comments are on the record. Thank you so much to all of you. With that, I turn it back over. Thank you, Chair Rivera, and we're going to have uh, Council Member Salamanca give an, off, an opening right now, if he's ready. Thank 
can you unmute me? Uh, can you hear me? Thank you, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairs Levin and Rivera for holding to the, uh, today's uh, um, hearing, which is extremely important. And I thank you for allowing me to speak on my bill. <clears throat> I join you today to ask for your support on introduction 2373, a bill that would require the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene uh, to waive the $40 fee for applicants seeking to amend a death certificate to list the causes of deaths as COVID-19 or health implications caused by COVID-19. Recognizing the devastation caused by the pandemic, New York City, the state of New York and the federal government began offering funeral assistance programs to help families with the unexpected cost of burying their loved ones. As people began submitting applications for assistance, New Yorkers realized their loved ones' death certificates were indicating natural death as the cause of death, as opposed to COVID-19 designation. As a result, FEMA held up funding applications since death certificates had to indicate deaths were quoted caused by, may have been caused by, or was likely a result of COVID-19 or COVID-19 symptoms. To correct the issue, New York City residents were being forced to pay a $40 non-refundable processing fee to DOH, MH, to apply for a death certificate amendment application. Appearing to be a prevalent enough issue, DOHMH owns website includes a tab um, labeled, how do I amend the death certificate so that it shows COVID-19 as the cause of death amongst its frequent, frequently asked questions page. Losing a loved one is hard enough, placing an additional financial burden to correct an issue made by medical professionals and wholly in, is wholly inappropriate in my opinion. This is why I introduced intro 2373. I wanna thank the 22 council members who have already signed on as co-sponsors, and I hope the rest of my colleagues will consider supporting this measure. Thank you. Thank you so much, council member Salamanca for leading on this important legislation, uh, which I'm pleased to support. And thank you for being here today. We've also been joined by council member Moya, council member Ayala, and council member Barron. And now I would like to turn it over, turn it back to our committee counsel, Sara Liss, to go down some procedural matters. Thank you, Chair Levine. Good morning, everyone. I'm Sara Liss, the counsel to the Committee on Health for the New York City Council. I will be moderating today's hearing. Before we begin, I wanted to go over a couple of brief procedural matters. I will be calling on panelists to testify. I wanna remind everyone that you will be on mute until I call on you to testify at which point you will be unmuted by the host. Please listen for your name to be called. And for everyone testifying today, please know that there may be a few seconds of delay after you're unmuted and we thank you in advance for your patience. At today's hearing, the run of show will be as follows. The first panel will be the administration followed by council member questions and then the public will testify. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in order. The first panel of the administration will include Dr. Dave Choksi, Commissioner of the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, and Dr. Andrew Wallach, Ambulatory Care Chief for Health and Hospitals. I will first administer the oath, and after, I will call on each panelist here from the administration to individually respond. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee, and to respond honestly to council member questions? Commissioner Choksi. Yes, I do. Thank you. Dr. Wallach. Yes, I do. And Commissioner, you can begin as soon as you're ready. Thank you so much. Um, and good morning, Chairs Levine and Rivera and members of the committees. Uh, I'm Dr. Dave Choksi, Commissioner of the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify today and provide an update on the city's efforts to address vaccine confidence and equity. Uh, I'm pleased to be joined today by my colleague, Dr. Andrew Wallach from New York City Health and Hospitals. Uh, it has been a long, challenging um, 18 months now, 19 months to say the least. Uh, I'd like to take a moment um, here at the top to thank our city's municipal workers and healthcare workers who have endeavored tirelessly throughout this pandemic. Without them, we would not be where we are today in terms of progress on increasing vaccination rates. And I'd like to thank the community groups who have similarly worked around the clock to serve the needs of their neighbors and members. And thank you also to the council 
You all have been through this with us, many of you and your families affected personally, I know, lending your voices and platforms to share critical information about COVID-19 transmission and vaccines, hosting events, and organizing town halls where experts can answer questions from your constituents. Though there is still more to be done, we should take a moment to acknowledge that almost 5.3 million New Yorkers are fully vaccinated. And as of today, over 82% of adults and over 72% of 12 to 17 year olds have received at least one dose of the vaccine. This is a monumental achievement when you consider the size and diversity of this city and the adversity we have all faced. It highlights what we all already know about our city. New Yorkers care about their families, we look out for our communities, and we believe in science. Together, we have saved so many lives and prevented so much suffering. A study that the health department partnered on with Yale University scientists estimated that the city's vaccination campaign prevented an estimated 250,000 cases, 44,000 hospitalizations, and 8,300 deaths related to COVID-19 through July 1st. And these are almost certainly conservative estimates since the time period studied does not yet account for cases, hospitalizations, and deaths prevented after July 1st when the more transmissible Delta variant was dominant in New York City. Beyond these bottom line outcomes, a core focus of our historic vaccination campaign from its inception has been equity. And we are continually working hand in hand with the city's task force on racial inclusion and equity, uh, the TRIE, to address the disparities we have seen in vaccine uptake thus far. We are doing this via an equity strategy that includes increasing access by locating city vaccine sites, engagement, and media in communities that need it most, with a focus on the 33 task force neighborhoods. And our strategy is bearing fruit. We are seeing equity gaps closing. The vaccination rate among Latinos is now 9% higher than white New Yorkers. Black New Yorkers are now experiencing the fastest percentage growth in vaccination rates. And about 60% of first and single doses in August and September have been administered to Black and Latino New Yorkers. This is remarkable progress, but we are not done. The health department and I personally am committed to further closing the gap for neighborhoods that have been hardest hit by the COVID-19 pandemic. The city has pulled out all the stops to ensure that all New Yorkers have access to vaccines. We stood up a massive vaccine access infrastructure through city run brick and mortar sites and supported over 3000 providers in getting vaccine into their facilities. We facilitated over 12,000 free rides to vaccine sites citywide, vaccinated over 27,000 people in their homes, and created a program where community partners were able to help people make appointments over the phone. We've broken down language access barriers by bringing translators and translated materials to vaccine sites, and we have entire vaccine vans staffed end-to-end -end in language. And we have met people where they are by deploying mobile vaccine via tent, van, and bus to over 1,100 locations across the city where people live, work, dine, commute, go to school, and play. I'd like to note in particular the city's event-based campaigns with partners, including many of you. We've brought vaccine to locations identified by small businesses like restaurants, unions, over 700 schools, senior centers, NYCHA developments, and soon movie theaters as well. I'd also like to take this moment to thank all of our incredible agency partners in this work, including our own staff at the health department and our colleagues at the Vaccine Command Center, h, &H the Test and Trace Corps, NYCHA, DIFTA, MOYA, and New York City Emergency Management, among so many others. We have been able to bring vaccine to New Yorkers because of this partnership and the teamwork in pursuit of a shared goal. We have also worked to build confidence in the vaccines, acknowledging that there are many New Yorkers who did not and still do not feel comfortable getting vaccinated against COVID-19. 
The reasons for this are vast. Many are rooted in decades long experiences with racism in the healthcare system, general mistrust in government and misinformation about vaccines. Addressing these concerns takes time and there is no one size fits all approach. Above all, our outreach must be grounded in the evidence, in equity and in empathy. I've said this before, we need the truth about COVID-19 vaccines to spread faster than the virus itself. And our community partners have been at the heart of all of this challenging work. They are trusted messengers in their communities. Through existing work and additional funding via the Public Health Corps, the city will support approximately 100 community-based organizations, or CBOs, to conduct community engagement to provide current information on COVID-19 and the vaccines. These critical partners have been on the ground in the communities they serve, helping to encourage and facilitate vaccination in languages, voices, and messaging that is known and trusted. A great example of this work has been our team's focused efforts in predominantly Caribbean communities. To address vaccine confidence and low uptake of vaccine in these communities, a dedicated group of health department staff of Caribbean ancestry got to work. The team provides one-on-one -on -one engagement and vaccination resources in partnership with CBOs and federally qualified health centers at Caribbean community events. They have also focused on working with home health aid associations to build vaccine confidence among staff. This engagement is meaningful and impactful, and I must say often joyful as well. And we have already seen increased uptake in these communities. But as I said earlier, it takes time. Every, uh, even a single percent increase in vaccination rates week over week is progress, and it represents prevented suffering. In addition to this work, we regularly work with several hundred community-based and faith groups to disseminate information, hold events such as community conversations on vaccination, and train leaders as vaccine navigators through over 150 Train the Trainer sessions. We have held over 5,000 events related to the vaccine since December of 2020. We know these conversations our partners are having about the tough issues particularly around mistrust, will take multiple tries. Regarding misinformation, based on surveys and anecdotal information that we systematically gather through events and community engagement, we know that misinformation about the vaccine is a driving force for those who still lack vaccine confidence. I'll take this opportunity to correct the record about some common pieces of misinformation. First, the vaccines are safe. They do not cause COVID-19 and they do not contain the virus. Second, the vaccines are still necessary even if you've had COVID-19 or if you have antibodies for COVID-19. Third, it is safe to get the vaccines even if you are pregnant, breastfeeding, or trying to become pregnant. And finally, the vaccines are the best way to reduce the risk of getting COVID-19 and experiencing severe illness from it. To address the most common pieces of misinformation we have heard, we created our Truth About COVID Vaccines document, designed infographics on how the vaccines work, launched an entire COVID facts website, and have a You're Right, You Should Know campaign to answer common questions about the vaccines. We have YouTube video series, talking points for our community partners, and a call center staffed by nurses and public health experts that people can call to ask questions about COVID-19 vaccines. And you might've seen some of my public service announcements. In terms of media, the city has spent more than $100 million on citywide education campaigns about COVID-19 and the vaccines this calendar year alone. In addition to launching video series featuring city leaders, we have taken a multi-layered approach to our messaging, including using storytelling from everyday New Yorkers, from neighborhood providers to community members. And we have partnered with outside organizations like the New York Latino Film Festival to bring these real stories to life. 
These campaigns are designed to promote vaccine availability, address common drivers of misinformation and key confidence issues, and to share timely information about news like booster eligibility. Further, we know that people need to hear from their own clinical providers about the vaccines. They wanna hear it safe and that their doctor recommends it. For instance, I think about one of my recent patients who had been delaying getting vaccinated because he was worried that the side effects would be too disruptive to his life. I heard him out, shared my own story of getting the single dose Johnson & Johnson vaccine and my experience with mild side effects and also conveyed my sincere worries about his health in the context of the Delta variant, particularly because he had multiple chronic conditions. By the end of our visit, I had not quite convinced him to get vaccinated on the spot, but I was relieved when he came back a couple of weeks later and chose to get the J&J shot for himself. It's conversations like this that clinicians have been engaging in throughout our vaccination campaign bolstering New Yorkers' confidence in the COVID-19 vaccines. To this end, we have worked tirelessly to engage providers and ensure they not only have a supply of vaccine to give to patients, but also have the most current information about vaccine safety, where patients can get vaccine outside of their offices, facts to counter misinformation, and information about city incentive programs. The health department has engaged over 2,000 provider offices since February through remote technical assistance and our boots on the ground public health detailing program. And we recently launched a $35 million program to compensate providers for vaccine counseling that we believe could be a model for the nation. Further, earlier this month, I issued a commissioner's advisory to strongly urge healthcare providers serving patients in New York City to offer information at every patient visit on the efficacy, availability, and administration of COVID-19 vaccines. The latest salvo in our Use Every Opportunity campaign, which was launched specifically for clinical providers in May. In addition to lowering access barriers and building vaccine confidence, the city developed an incentives program to encourage more New Yorkers to get the vaccine, which, in addition to offering free tickets to sports events and museums, gym memberships, and more, now offers $100 for New Yorkers vaccinated at specific sites across the city, or even in their homes. Another major component of our incentive programming is the NYC Vaccine Referral Bonus Initiative, which provides direct payments of $100 per vaccine referral to civic, faith, tenant, and other associations. We've collected some great anecdotes from folks at vaccination sites about their experience with the incentives. And I'd love to just share a couple here. First, an older woman came in to get vaccinated and noted that her birthday was coming up and she wanted to get vaccinated so she could feel safe going to a restaurant and celebrate and that she was going to use the incentive money to buy herself a birthday present. Other patients have remarked that the $100 would mean being able to replace their broken TVs, pay their phone bills, and buy school supplies. We know that vaccination is our most powerful tool for turning the page on the pandemic. And while the decision to get vaccinated is an individual choice, it has immense community consequence. Vaccination is how we return to school, recover our small businesses, and resume aspects of our life from the most memorable to the mundane. And in the face of the more dangerous Delta variant, we knew stronger medicine was needed. The time has come to build upon the foundation we laid with broad access to vaccines, addressing confidence and providing incentives. I am proud that New York City has led the nation in implementing vaccination requirements where they are warranted. From the key to NYC for certain indoor activities, to my commissioner's order for all Department of Education staff to be vaccinated. Particularly during a global pandemic, there are no risk-free choices, just choices to take different risks. Allow me to say that again. During a global pandemic, there are no risk-free choices, just choices to take different risks. The city of New York, with the leadership of Mayor de Blasio, 
has chosen to markedly reduce risk by increasing vaccination. You can see for yourself in the graph included in my written testimony how our vaccine policies are correlated with increasing first and single dose administration from July through September. Vaccines work and vaccine mandates work, particularly when they are paired with efforts to build vaccine confidence, lower access barriers, and provide incentives as we have in New York City. Very quickly, I will turn to the legislation being heard today. The Health Department supports Intro 2373, and we are prepared to begin waiving fees for this specific type of death certificate change immediately. As this relates to the federal program for funeral assistance, the Health Department has detailed information on its website to explain the options for accessing that program, including the option to make a change to the death certificate itself. This is something we have been working on internally and very much appreciate the council members' legislation and commitment to support New Yorkers who have lost loved ones due to COVID-19. I wanna thank Chairs Rivera and Levine for holding this hearing today and for being committed champions in the effort to stop the spread of COVID-19. Thank you so much for your partnership throughout this challenging year and a half, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. I believe we're gonna start with questions from Speaker Johnson. Uh, thank you, Chair Levine. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Chokshi, <clears throat> for that uh, testimony. I really appreciate your time and all you've done for the city during this uh, really, really challenging time. Uh, you <clears throat> laid out the numbers uh, related to uh, African-American New Yorkers, uh, Hispanic and Latino New Yorkers, white New Yorkers, uh, and the, the vaccination rates uh, of each one of those uh, groups. You've detailed those. Um, are, are, can you speak and let us know if you're targeting, if there are targeting strategies that you're using by race, by age, by location. I wanna understand how much we are drilling down into why a particular subset of the population is hesitant. And if we have sort of individual strategies for those populations to try to increase the vaccination numbers for folks that are still feeling some level of hesitancy. Um, thank you so much, Mr. Speaker, for um, the question and also for, for your committed leadership um, over uh, the entire COVID-19 response. Um, with respect to your question, uh, yes, our vaccine equity strategy is oriented around um, specific interventions, uh, you know, which I've thought about as uh, age, race, and place. Um, thinking, you know, very specifically about each of those categories, um, knowing that uh, you know, our methods to reach out to older New Yorkers will have to be different than for younger New Yorkers. Um, I spoke a little bit about the ways in which we have thought about um, race explicit strategies to uh, close uh, the racial equity gaps that we have seen in vaccination rates and some promising um, uh, progress in recent weeks related to that. And then importantly, also bringing to bear place-based approaches. Uh, we've done this in a variety of ways, um, making sure that uh, the, the local strategies that we bring to bear are informed by community members themselves. Um, but with all of this, taking a data-driven approach to look at where we may be seeing lagging vaccination rates um, and painting a complete picture for us to, um, to be able to address them. The, uh, you know, the ways in which we have done this, I gave a couple of examples of them. Um, but often it means actually bringing all of those pieces together of age, race, and place uh, so that we have very specific strategies for um, very specific neighborhoods in New York City, uh, which of course the people who live in those neighborhoods know the best um, and whom we are partnering with for them. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, you know, <clears throat> as you mentioned in your testimony, uh, there is still resistance, of course, and hesitancy uh, across racial groups. But if we speak particularly about Black New Yorkers and, and Black women in particular, they often have or have had good reasons to be skeptical of the medical community. And it's not just a historic problem. 
maternal morbidity rates for black women are still three times higher than those for white women. So I would love to hear how the city is working to address the concerns of those who have been historically mistreated by healthcare systems in our country and even in our city. Um, thank you very much. Uh, this is a fundamentally important question. Uh, we cannot have equity without racial justice. Um, and it starts with an acknowledgement of all of the ways in which uh, the, uh, the disparities, the inequities that we're seeing today, uh, unfortunately have um, a long history in uh, the many ways uh, in which um, various groups, but particularly Black New Yorkers, uh, have not been well served by government uh, or by the healthcare system. But as you're pointing out, it is not solely a historic problem. Um, those issues reverberate uh, in our healthcare system and in uh, our approaches to, to um, government uh, intervention still today. Um, with respect to how we are addressing it, it starts by, um, by making sure that we do have race explicit strategies uh, in our outreach, um, in our engagement, um, making sure that the ways in which we have lowered barriers to access also take this into account. So some of the, um, the engagement that we have done, particularly with clinicians, with healthcare providers across the city, um, that public health detailing that I mentioned where health department teams uh, go out and sit with providers uh, to empower and equip them with uh, what they need um, to serve their patients much of that has focused in our task force neighborhoods and particularly with community providers who are serving black and brown New Yorkers. So that's one very tangible example. The other one relies on our community-based organizations and the partners that we have in specific communities. I mentioned our Caribbean engagement campaign as one example of how we have done that um, in specific neighborhoods you know, across the city, particularly in, in Brooklyn and Queens. Um, and there are countless other examples where uh, our approach has been for us to take a step forward in addressing these racial inequities. It actually means the health department and city government take a step back and instead invest in those community based organizations and empower partners uh, to be able to serve the people whom they've been serving in many cases for decades. Uh, Commissioner, I, I mean, I think you're getting at this, but can you just be a little bit more um, explicit and specific about what are we doing and what can we do to establish trust with these communities who rightfully and understandably uh, have mistrust uh, given the history of what happens, as I mentioned, and also the current inequities that exist. What are some of the tangible specific things that we are doing to establish that trust in the face of sort of uh, rightful fears that people have? Yes, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, and thank you for allowing me to elaborate a little bit more. Um, for me, trust uh, is very similar to the ways in which I, I try to build trust uh, in my own exam room when I'm taking care of patients. Uh, we have to start by listening with humility. Um, and so that's what, uh, you know, the engagement that we've done with the thousands of events and town halls, where it's not just about disseminating information, but it's also about listening uh, about concerns that are emanating from the community, understanding the questions that people have and sitting with them rather than immediately leaping to, uh, to try to um, provide answers to them. So that's one piece of it. Uh, another piece is um, the specific types of community partnerships. For example, with faith leaders who are often more trusted in communities than government representatives are, uh, ensuring that faith leaders have the information that they need, um, that we partner with them on vaccination events. Uh, you know, we've now had hundreds of pop-up vaccination events um, at churches, temples, synagogues across the city. Um, I mentioned some of what we're doing with respect to um, engaging clinicians uh, around the city with a particular focus on uh, racial inequities. Um, and we've also seen in recent weeks uh, that, um, you know, the provision of incentives, particularly the $100 uh, incentive for vaccination, has also had robust uptake um, within specific communities. Uh, so all of these things taken together, you know, I'll be the first to admit there is not a silver bullet for, um, you know, for redressing the uh, centuries of structural racism 
that have existed in our country. Um, but it does mean that we have to uh, bring to bear all of these approaches, all of these interventions at once um, to try to extend the protection of vaccination to the people in the communities who can most benefit from it. Commissioner, are there any other cities or states that uh, you know of or, or the department has identified that, is ha that are having more success in reaching groups with low vaccination rates? Or are you working with health departments in other parts of the country to help develop new strategies based off of success that certain municipalities or states are seeing given some of the strategies that have uh, been, been brought to bear? Um, yes, thank you for the thoughtful question, Mr. Speaker. Um, and the answer is absolutely yes. We are in constant communication. I myself with um, fellow health commissioners, uh, particularly um, in other large municipalities, um, in regular contact to be able to learn from them, again, with humility. Uh, you know, we uh, take a lot of pride in being uh, at the vanguard here in New York City, um, but we will also shamelessly uh, adopt, you know, any ideas where people seem to uh, have been out in front. Um, and, you know, some of those strategies, particularly with respect to how we have refined our local approaches, um, you know, the specific types of partnerships that we've engaged in, uh, whether it's um, with faith leaders or um, with uh, community-based organizations that are providing social services, um, those have certainly been refined through those conversations. I'll also say that, you know, it's a bi-directional um, conversation and we've gotten particularly good feedback uh, from other municipalities who have learned from our approach to in-home vaccination. We were one of the um, first cities to expand our in-home vaccination program uh, to everyone who is eligible to get vaccinated. Um, we were one of the first cities to provide that $100 incentive uh, and many of the vaccine requirements um, that I described. Uh, and so uh, it, there is a nice cross-pollination that occurs with our colleagues around the country. Okay, I have a, I have a lot of questions. I'm not gonna get to all of them because uh, the chairs have questions and there are a lot of members here today as well have questions. So I'm gonna try to just quickly rifle through a bunch of them. And if you could, uh, I, I'm happy to, I, I like your full answers, but if there's a way to, to sort of just quickly answer some of these questions uh, so I can get to the chairs and the other members that are here today, that would be great. Okay, so I'm just gonna, I'm gonna hop right in. Uh, what percentage of New Yorkers do we need to be vaccinated to achieve herd immunity in the city? And do you think we will ever get there? Um, thanks, I'll try to be succinct on this one, but it is a nuanced um, question in that uh, the threshold for herd immunity is very different in the context of the Delta variant. Um, and the short answer is we need to get as many New Yorkers vaccinated as possible. So there's no uh, threshold or even upper limit, you know, that I would point to other than to say that uh, the Delta variant makes it even more urgent for us to close the gaps that we've talked about and raise our vaccination rates as high as they can possibly go. So you won't give a specific number? Uh, Mr. Speaker, there is no specific number, um, you know, based on what we know about herd immunity um, and the fact that the Delta variant is even more contagious, uh, what it means is that we have to push our numbers as high as they can possibly go. Okay. Um, do you think there's a significant portion of the unvaccinated population that just isn't persuadable? Uh, well, um, from the data that we have, um, the answer is yes. There's likely to be, uh, you know, some proportion of the population uh, that uh, will continue to refuse vaccination. Um, but I strongly believe that that number is relatively small. Um, and we have seen just over the last, you know, a uh, few months that uh, people who were initially reluctant to get vaccinated because of all of the different approaches that I've talked about and the iterative approach, you know, to engaging them, uh, that more and more people have chosen to get vaccinated. Do you have any estimate of what you think that number is, the, the folks that are just not persuadable? Um, of the eligible population, you know, I would, I would estimate it at uh, around 15% um, or less. Uh, and I think that we should drive that number as low as it can possibly go. Do you think it's possible to effectively counteract 
the anti-vaxxer movement and the vaccine misinformation movement that has uh, really sprung up on social media uh, and uh, in other sources that has undermined uh, public health efforts? Do you think it's that, that we can possibly, that it's possible to effectively counteract that? Yes, Mr. Speaker, it's not just possible, it is imperative for us to do this. Um, and there are ways in which, you know, we have uh, successfully addressed uh, a lot of the misinformation that is circulating, uh, but it takes all of us. This is not, um, you know, solely a health department responsibility or even a city government responsibility. It means uh, everyone working in concert to ensure that it is uh, the scientific facts that are lifted up um, and that people hear about them, not just from authorities, including medical authorities, uh, but from their neighbors, uh, you know, from, from other people whom they know and trust. It, it, I'm sure you have run into this. You mentioned this in your testimony. Uh, you personally are a doctor. You, you still see patients. Uh, when you have to talk to someone who is opposed to getting the vaccine, what would you say in, in, in 45 seconds? What should, what, should, uh, what should a doctor be saying? What should someone who's not a clinician be saying to someone who is opposed to getting vaccinated? What is the sort of the elevator pitch to them uh, on why they should get vaccinated and to try to move them away from a place of hesitancy to a place of uh, potential and saying, okay, I'm open to this now. Um, well, yes, thank you so much for the question. And I'll see if my colleague, Dr. Wallach, um, wants to chime in on this. He also takes care of patients uh, at Bellevue Hospital, as I do. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I have to admit, if I only have 45 seconds, usually I'm spending that listening to the patient rather than talking. Um, and, you know, that has been so important uh, in my own experience to build trust with the people that I'm taking care of. Uh, but after that, um, what I focus on is... Uh, number one, to acknowledge uh, some of the concerns that um, they may be, you know, bringing to the conversation. Uh, number two, to make a very clear and strong recommendation for vaccination that is born from my um, concern about, uh, about my patient's health and for them to hear from me directly how important it is uh, as uh, something that I think can, can protect them uh, and may even save their life. Um, and the last thing that I often do is I will talk to them about, um, you know, what activities they think may become safer if they were to get vaccinated, uh, which I find often unlocks a different, you know, part of the conversation where people um, begin to appreciate how fundamentally tied in, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic vaccination is to the activities that they love and cherish. Okay. Uh, I, again, I'm not going to get to all my questions. I just want to ask one final question. I know that Chairs Levine and Rivera are likely going to ask about our city workforce and the low numbers that I mentioned um, before among certain city agency workforce uh, 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 places where we want the number to come up. But I just have one sort of final question because I don't want to take up too much time. Would you support a full vaccine mandate? No testing option for the entire city workforce? Um, I do support uh, vaccine requirements, you know, where they are warranted. Uh, and we have been very supportive of, uh, as the mayor has said, climbing the ladder. Uh, it is important to make sure that we do this in a methodical and staged way um, to bring people along, you know, to make sure that people do get their questions answered. Uh, and so I was a strong supporter of the vaccination or testing a mandate that we have rolled out. Um, and we have to continue to watch the situation as it evolves. Uh, and it may be the case that uh, a full vaccine mandate is warranted um, in the future. But right now, uh, I would say that I support uh, the vaccination or testing mandate um, and moving toward full vaccine mandates in specific segments, as we have seen for healthcare workers um, and for Department of Education staff. Well, yeah, what about for first, re for, for first responders? Should first responders, uh, should there be a full vaccine mandate without a testing option for first responders? Um, I wanna get as many first responders fully vaccinated um, as quickly as possible. And I think there's great work uh, that is already ongoing to raise those rates. Uh, and we will have to see if that is, uh, you know, another area where climbing the ladder is necessary. 
to get uh, the rates as high as they can possibly go. Okay, thank you, uh, Commissioner. I'm gonna turn it back to Chairs Rivera and Levine. Thank you so much, Speaker Johnson, for those excellent questions and for your ongoing leadership on COVID and equity. Uh, Commissioner, uh, I appreciate your comments uh, in the opening statement on the number one issue I hear uh, from the hesitant, which is, well, I had COVID and therefore I don't need to get the vaccine. Could you explain why that logic doesn't hold? Yes, um, and again, allow me to say thank you so much, Chair Levine, for everything that you've done during COVID response and particularly to get uh, information out across the city uh, I and the health department are truly grateful for all of your efforts as well. Um, and as usual, you get to the heart of the matter with respect to, you know, the most salient questions. This is one that we have heard um, time and again with respect to people who have been previously infected with COVID-19 and whether vaccination is needed for them. And the answer is uh, an unequivocal yes. Um, we do know that uh, there is some immunity that is provided, um, you know, through uh, prior infection. But what we don't know is the precise strength and duration of that immunity. Um, and the real world choice that people who have been previously infected face is whether or not to get vaccinated. And we have rigorous science that shows that um, the, the right choice among those is for people to get vaccinated because it uh, strengthens immunity and may extend the duration of immunity as well. The CDC published a specific study showing that the risk of reinfection was over 2.3 times as high among people with prior infection who remained unvaccinated compared to people with prior infection uh, who have been vaccinated. So to put it all together, it's my strong recommendation. Uh, if you've had COVID-19 in the past, you know how serious and significant it can be um, and take the step to, to get uh, additional protection by getting vaccinated. Thank you. Chair Rivera raised some excellent questions about the vaccine uh, take up rate among New Yorkers age 80, 85 and older. And I'm sure she'll ask questions about that. I wanna ask about the younger cohort which is uh, New Yorkers age 12 to 17. Uh, I have not seen uh, a racial breakdown on vaccine rates in that age category. I wonder if you could comment first on where we're at citywide, what's the rate of full vaccination among uh, adolescents? And could you talk about uh, equity issues you might see in the, in the data considering I think anecdotal information that we all have that there's extremely wide variation in the vaccine take up rates among different social demographic groups for young people? Yes, um, thank you for this uh, important question. Uh, so overall, we are um, approaching 73% uh, of 12 to 17 year olds with at least um, one dose of the vaccine. Uh, I don't have at my fingertips the um, proportion that's fully vaccinated, but I'm sure we can get that shortly. Um, and we do follow, um, you know, not just race ethnicity breakdowns within this data, but also um, uh, uh, geographic breakdowns with respect to uh, differences by borough. Um, this is uh, on the health department's website at nyc.gov slash COVID data. But um, briefly, where we are seeing um, relatively high vaccination rates among adolescents is uh, among Asian and um, Native Hawaiian uh, Pacific Islander, as well as Hispanic Latino adolescents, where we're seeing lower rates is among black and white um, teenagers. And so we do have more work to do to ensure that, um, you know, that the youngest New Yorkers who are currently eligible for vaccination continue to increase those rates as well. So are there young people specific strategies reaching out to, um... Uh, black teenagers and uh, interesting to hear you identify white teenagers as well that are focused on on youth specifically? Um, yes, we've had uh, specific um, outreach campaigns to youth. Uh, I'll just go over them very briefly. Uh, you know, a lot of this is through our, our media um, where we have uh, done, you know, focus groups and testing on specific messages that, you know, most resonate um, with youth. 
there's a particular social media aspect to that, um, knowing, you know, how much, uh, perhaps too much, um, adolescents are, are using, you know, social media to, to communicate uh, with their friends and get information. Um, and then very importantly, we had uh, an extremely strong push um, in the weeks leading up to um, the first day of school, what was called our Vax to School campaign, uh, where um, working with uh, the Chancellor and the Department of Education, um, we did uh, a whole slate of events, um, you know, with uh, youth, um, often at um, places where we knew they would be excited to get back to, whether it was at a football practice, you know, or um, at uh, people who are gathering to uh, get back to their dance classes, um, you know, doing things to answer um, the questions that youth specifically have about vaccination and providing ready access to the vaccine as well. We did that um, starting in early August uh, through um, the first two weeks of September. And then um, during the first week of school, I'm very proud to say we're the only large city that was able to accomplish having a vaccination clinic at over 700 schools. That was every single school building um, that had uh, children who were eligible to get vaccinated. We had an on-site vaccine clinic um, to, to provide ready access as well. So um, there has been a, a quite a bit of activity, but we're not done yet. And we wanna reach um, as many uh, young people as possible to get them vaccinated too. Yes, I was very happy that you offered vaccination to so many schools the first week, but it was, I think, only that week. Is there plans to have another uh, a push, another week, uh, another Vax to School event where you give people a second shot if now they're ready? Um, yes, we are continuing, you know, vaccine clinics, particularly around uh, second shots um, to ensure that people... Sorry, I meant second chance, uh, poorly choice of chosen words. I mean, people who might not have been ready to get the vaccine the first week of school, but... Now, um, maybe they're around classmates mates who have said, hey, I got my shot, it's fine. There might be folks who are now ready. Yes, um, we are doing that as well. Uh, it won't be in every single school building, but it will still be you know, at a scale where access will be widespread and ready. Um, you know, we have our school-based health centers um, that are often uh, you know, very useful sites to, to provide not just COVID vaccination, but all of the other, you know, suite of preventive services that um, teenagers need uh, and which over the past 18 months, you know, they haven't had a chance to actually take advantage of, whether we're talking about uh, reproductive health or dental services. Uh, so all to say, yes, we will continue those efforts. Um, and I should say beyond uh, those school-based vaccine clinics, we're also working hand in hand with pediatricians across the city. Um, making sure that they have supplies of vaccine um, and they've been a particular focus of the public health detailing efforts are going you know physically boots on the ground um, making sure that we've engaged clinicians in our vaccination efforts as well thank you we've been talking so far in the hearing about uh the first two shots or in the case of johnson and johnson the first shot that's what uh is is undoubtedly our number one priority we want everybody everybody who's eligible to get uh, their full first two shots or first shot of J&J. &J. But now boosters are widely available in New York City to a whole variety of groups. And uh, for people who are vulnerable or at risk, uh, not yet the general population, but for, for those uh, specific groups, the booster shots are important. And I, I worry that we'll have equity challenges in the booster administration as well as we have in the broader vaccine effort um, I wonder if you could share with us data on the take up rate in booster shots so far, and if you're seeing any trends uh, related to equity so far. Um, yes, thank you for this important question. If you'll allow me, I'll just reiterate the important point that you made at the top, which is our foremost priority remains on uh, first doses and then the second dose to complete full vaccination getting people who remain unvaccinated vaccinated remains the single most public health intervention for this stage of the pandemic. Um, with that said, you're absolutely right. Um, booster doses do confer additional protection, you know, in certain circumstances. Uh, right now, um, for people who received their second dose of Pfizer at least six months ago, 
um, there are select groups that are eligible for uh, a third dose of the Pfizer vaccine. Um, that's particularly people who are 65, uh, 65 years and older, um, or people who are adults but have an underlying health condition or otherwise you know, at high risk of severe COVID-19 disease. Um, for them, we are, <clears throat> excuse me, monitoring uptake closely. We are still quite early, as you know, in um, you know, administering booster doses. It's only uh, about um, 12 to 13,000 um, booster doses that have been administered thus far, um, but we will follow patterns um, by age, uh, race, and place, as I mentioned earlier, to ensure that equity is a core pillar of our strategy for, um, for administering boosters as well. Two more brief points, if you'll allow me. One is we're also working with long-term care facilities like nursing homes, and that is also a core part of our equity strategy related to the booster rollout, um, because we know that that's where there's some of the greatest benefit with respect to the protection that additional doses can confer. And then the second point is um, distinguishing booster doses from third doses for people who are moderately and severely immunocompromised. Um, this means you know, people who uh, have cancer and are undergoing active chemotherapy or people who've had a kidney transplant and are on immunosuppressive medications. Um, third doses for both the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines are available for that um, category. Uh, of New Yorkers, uh, and we've seen um, over 70,000 of those third doses be administered, and that's also particularly important, particularly for people who are medically vulnerable. Thank you. Can, can you just clarify whether Moderna recipients can get the booster as a third dose, uh, or can they, can they get uh, a Pfizer booster? Are there circumstances where uh, a physician could prescribe that uh, and uh, is there any hope for those of us who uh, got the Johnson & Johnson dose to get clarity on the need for either an R mRNA booster or a second J&J? &J? Um, thank you. This is something we are following very closely, um, and I want to give you the short and simple answer first, which is uh, for people who receive the Moderna and Johnson & Johnson vaccines, boosters are not um, currently uh, recommended, and I do not recommend uh, that, um, that people who receive those vaccines uh, receive boosters at this time. Um, the reason is that we are still waiting on additional data um, and we always wanna be able to follow um, the scientific evidence that confirms um, safety and efficacy of booster doses among Moderna and Johnson & Johnson uh, vaccine recipients. Um, you know, I certainly understand this uh, myself as someone who got the J&J &J vaccine. I know that people are anxious to learn when they may qualify for a booster. And I want to speak, you know, unequivocally to people who did receive other vaccines. Um, you know, I, I hear you and uh, we are also eager to um, expand eligibility, um, but we always want to do that um, with the strength of scientific evidence behind us. I expect that that will be forthcoming. Um, within uh, weeks rather than months. Uh, and of course, we will keep New York City posted about that. Thank you. My, my sense only based on anecdotes is that the take up rate for third shots for people with immunocompromised in New York City has been disappointingly low. I don't know if you can comment on that cohort and whether the 12 to 13,000 number you cited earlier is inclusive of that group. Um, thank you. No, I, I don't believe it has been um, disappointingly low uh, as yet. You know, we, we have over 70,000 um, people who are immunocompromised who have received the third dose. Uh, you know, we estimate um, around 150,000 may be eligible based on the definition of moderate and severe immunocompromised. So we still do have some work to do. And it is important, you know, to, um, to get that additional protection for people who are immunocompromised. Um, but I think that we are making good progress. I will say, you know, sort of as more of a clinical matter, um, often these are patients who are already in care and maybe in care, you know, with a specialist uh, with whom they want to have a conversation about vaccination. And so it's a little bit different than, um, you know, the, the overall vaccination effort where we're encouraging people to go to your nearest pharmacy or, you know, one of our city vaccine sites. 
Um, rather, people you know really value that conversation with their own um, healthcare provider even more so. Uh, so uh, that's what I would say about that. And then the 12 to the 13,000 uh, is, is not inclusive of the third doses for moderately and severely immunocompromised. Those are, those are much better numbers than I expected on immunocompromised. So um, good news on that front. Uh, I wanted to ask about the vaccination rate at the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene amongst your, I think it's 6,000 staff. I, sh I should know that number, but uh, I know you have a mandate in place for people who have uh, clinical duties at the department, but I think that's a pretty small portion of your total workforce. Uh, what's your VAX rate overall? Uh, how's the mandate working for clinical staff? Have you lost staff who refused? Uh, and what strategies are you using to overcome hesitancy amongst your own workforce? And I guess finally, uh, wh wh why not put a mandate in place, at least for all staff in the Department of Health, uh, while we uh, as you say, climb the ladder for other, other city agencies. Um, thank you for these questions as well, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, this is something that I think about um, you know, uh, very hard and, and that I care about because it's about the safety of my own team members, my own staff. Um, I'm pleased that we have made good progress. Uh, we're at about 84% um, of, uh, of staff who have received um, at least one dose. Uh, and most of those, the vast, vast majority of them are already fully vaccinated. I believe it's about 80 or 81% uh, from the last numbers that I had seen. Uh, we wanna get those numbers still higher um, because, uh, because it matters you know, with respect to the safety of our workplace, um, as well as for the safety of the people whom we are serving. Um, and so we are taking additional steps, as you alluded to, for our clinical staff. You know, these are the staff um, in uh, our sexual health clinics, our tuberculosis clinics, who are taking care of patients. Everyone from, uh, you know, the clerical assistant uh, and the custodian uh, to the clinicians um, will be required uh, under New York State, um, under the New York State mandate uh, to be fully vaccinated as well. Uh, and that is well on its way. Um, and uh, we will, you know, along with the rest of the city uh, workforce, see if there are other things that we need to do uh, to climb the ladder, uh, you know, with respect to additional vaccine requirements uh, to get our numbers still higher. One thing that I'll highlight, you know, you asked about specific approaches that we're using um, to, um, uh, to address vaccine confidence among our own team members. And I'm so proud of the ways in which the health department uh, has been thoughtful about doing this. I'll just highlight two specific elements. One is uh, what we call an immunization justice work group, um, which formed several months ago, uh, really to, to foster the conversations, you know, particularly uh, among our, uh, our team members of color, uh, to talk about um, reasons for uh, reluctance to get vaccinated, uh, and to make sure that people had a forum, um, you know, for those conversations. And the second idea that I wanted to highlight is that um, we have enlisted uh, some of our, our best uh, convincers, you know, our persuaders, um, the clinicians who are not just working to get all of New York City vaccinated, um, but hold office hours uh, with our own staff so that they can hear from a nurse or a doctor themselves. Uh, and have those more in-depth conversations with, um, with people that they already trust. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Dr. Wallach, I wonder if you could update us on the vaccine requirement in the h, &H system and uh, the progress you're making on, on vaccination this week. I understand that uh, on Monday there were about 5,000 h, h team members who were unvaccinated, but that that number has really gone down uh, pretty significantly so far over the week. Uh, and just give us a sense on how operations are going in light of uh, uh, staff that are not able to work because they haven't been vaccinated. Great, thank you very much for the question, uh, Mr. Chair. I will say that uh, overall 92% of our public health system is vaccinated. Uh, of our particular workforce, we know that nurses make up a very large component and happy to report that over 95% uh, of our nurses specifically have been vaccinated against COVID-19. However, uh, we um, did have about 500 nurses uh, who were unvaccinated and therefore not working in our facilities, but we had planned for this in advance uh, and have brought in agency nurses that have been trained and are now part of our team uh, to pick up that slack. 
as a result, all of our hospitals are fully operational uh, and are doing well at this time. That, that is great news. And, and could you just update us on, on any surge in vaccination this week? Uh, again, you were at, I think, 5,000 unvaccinated Monday. You know what that number is today? Yeah, so we absolutely saw an increase um, the week prior uh, to the mandate going in as well. Uh, in fact, we had been about at 85% of our workforce being vaccinated. And as I mentioned, that went up to 92%. Once the uh, vaccine mandate went live on Monday, we have had some increase uh, in staff who presented to work and decided to go ahead and get vaccinated. I don't have the specific number uh, in front of me right now, but we're definitely seeing um, folks uh, changing their mind and getting vaccinated. I'd be, I'd be curious to know that if you can get it for us. To me, the h, &H yes, experience is real validation for how important the vaccine mandates are, the fact that they work because yep. you've had people get vaccinated and your operations are continuing, which is critical. So uh, very happy kudos on that. Uh, uh, finally, um, Commissioner, uh, I just want to ask about vaccination in the child care context. Um, there is a mandate for child care staff in agencies which are, I guess, directly contracted by the city, but it, it's something of a patchwork sector and there's lots of um, child care agencies which are not directly contracted by the city, but they're all regulated by the Department of Health. And I think you even mandate flu vaccines for this population. Um, uh, why, why not just go for a more broad mandate for the whole sector? Um, yes, thank you for this thoughtful question. Uh, and it's a particularly important one. Uh, and the reason that we, um, we have done the childcare uh, requirements that we have already is in part because uh, younger children are not eligible to get vaccinated right now, as you well know. Um, and this is something that you know I, I care about, uh, not just as a doctor, but also as a father of a, of a young child myself. Uh, so it is something that we are actively looking at among you know, the various options for uh, climbing the ladder with uh, additional vaccine requirements. Uh, we wanted to start with the groups that um, were uh, directly contracted with the city um, and uh, and you know, in in coming uh, weeks, we will see um, if that warrants expansion as well. Thank you so much, Commissioner. Thank you, Dr. Wallach. And now I'm going to pass it over to my partner in this hearing, Chair Rivera. Thank you, Chair Levine. Awesome line of questioning. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Okay, I'll jump right in because I know we also have many of our colleagues who are uh, queued up. First, let me say I have seen the marketing campaign. I truly appreciate it. The commercials on TV, on the radio, in very different radio stations in terms of uh, constituencies. Uh, so I appreciate that. And I appreciate that you've taken vaccine hesitancy and, and turned it into the phrase vaccine confidence. I do appreciate that. So I guess let me start with, um, can you please share how hospitals have supported equitable vaccine distribution, particularly since our last hearing on vaccine access at the beginning of the year? Um, yes, certainly. I'll, I'll start and I'll turn to Dr. Wallach because h, &H has been such a vital uh, partner in this. Um, and the short answer is that um, we, we have found hospitals, uh, particularly health and hospitals and the independent safety net hospitals to be uh, absolutely vital partners with respect to meeting our equity goals. The reason for it, um, I know, uh, is, is familiar to you, Madam Chair. It's because uh, black and brown New Yorkers are um, more often cared for um, by those facilities they already have relationships at those hospitals and with the clinicians um, who work in those hospitals. So the numbers have borne that out. Um, we have worked with them uh, you know, very carefully to ensure that they have the vaccine supplies that they need, um, that we give them the science-based information that they need to communicate with uh, their patients um, and, uh, and have uh, you know, at every corner um, tried to work with them to actually get out beyond the four walls of the hospital into the communities that they're serving as well. I'll turn it to Dr. Wallach if he wants to add anything about H&H. &H. 
Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, thank you for the question, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, I will say indeed, uh, thank you uh, to the health department for keeping us well supplied uh, with vaccine, uh, which has really been tremendous. Uh, we have done very active outreach uh, to our patients uh, through multiple modalities. We reach out through our um, patient portal system, through text messages, through emails to our patients, and of course, phone calls. But as the commissioner said earlier in his testimony, perhaps one of the most powerful mechanisms is that one-on-one -on -one, uh, with the provider. I am a primary care physician and every single one of my patient encounter sessions begins uh, with the status of the patient with regard to COVID uh, and having that conversation, answering questions and building that confidence uh, in the vaccine. In addition, uh, we have worked with our Office of Emergency Management and have put together multiple materials in many different languages. We've also put together guides for our staff on how to speak to your patient about COVID hesitancy. Um, and so really I'm very proud of the work that we have done to make sure that equity is at the top of our list uh, as we think about vaccines here in New York City and with our patients. Thank you, Lynn. I'll ask about cultural humility in a second. But unlike during our January 2021 hearing on vaccine equity, vaccines are now widely available to New Yorkers. So how is the city working to ensure that communities with historically less access to healthcare are included in outreach efforts? And specifically, can you speak to efforts on reaching New Yorkers in multiple languages, communities that have limited digital literacy and who may not utilize internet, smartphones, or television, and individuals that are undocumented? Um, thank you so much for uh, for those important questions. Uh, and you're right. You know, now that um, vaccine supply is no longer the rate limiting step, it's meant that we've had to focus even more on um, decentralized access. You know, making sure that it's available not just in hubs like hospitals, but in family doctors' offices uh, and through the pop up events, for example, at NYCHA developments, um, in barber shops and salons in the places where we know, you know people are, are frequenting for other reasons, pharmacies, um, et cetera. Uh, and so you know, we have worked um, to, uh, to create that decentralization and pair it with our efforts to build vaccine confidence. Um, so when you actually have vaccination available in uh, you know, a place where someone is going to, um, you know, to worship, or uh, where they're going to work uh, or where they're going for recreation. Um, that is the way to combine our efforts to build trust and confidence with ready access to the vaccine. Um, I spoke a little bit about the ways in which we have um, sought to uh, surmount um, various uh, health literacy barriers and thank you for laying them out thoughtfully. Um, it is uh, not just about um, language, although that's very important. It's also about digital literacy, and it's about um, fear and anxiety um, that, uh, that many of our um, undocumented neighbors also feel. So a little bit on each of those in turn. Um, you know, I mentioned uh, the ways in which we have made all of our materials accessible in uh, the most common languages spoken by New Yorkers. Uh, but also all of the things that um, we're providing with respect to, for example, telephonic services, whether it's 877-VAX for NYC or our nurse uh, phone lines, uh, all of those do have interpretation you know, options available. Um, I'm so proud of the ways in which our health department staff um, who are multilingual uh, have held uh, multiple events in uh, their own native languages. Um, and, you know, that's everything from uh, Spanish to Bengali to Mandarin, uh, but also um, less commonly spoken languages, such as uh, indigenous Central American languages as well. Um, so that's a little bit of what we've done on the language front. With respect to di digital literacy, um, this is something that we've thought about, you know, carefully. Um, and it all relies on the human touch and you know, the one-on-one -on -one conversations. Uh, we've done uh, so much canvassing. And again, I have to um, acknowledge Test and Trace and Health and Hospitals who has been leading uh, in this way. Um, we've knocked on, uh, on millions of uh, doors. Uh, we've had uh, so many you know, ways in which um, we're not relying on the phone or the TV or the internet 
but actually a face-to-face -face encounter, even during you know, a global pandemic. Um, and then finally, with respect to undocumented immigrants, um, I have to start by saying that this is a place where community-based organizations have really shined. Um, there are so many CBOs who have dedicated um, you know, all of their work to better serving uh, undocumented New Yorkers. Uh, and so we've worked in partnership with them on our outreach efforts, on uh, vaccination events. Uh, they have given us you know, intel about um, what people are particularly fearful of, where they're more comfortable in seeking vaccination and less comfortable. Um, and so that's been a very productive relationship for us to, um, to try to surmount uh, those many barriers that exist. Yeah, and I would say, of course, the, the community-based organizations, the faith-based groups, advocates, community providers, I mean, they're, as you mentioned, the most important in delivering culturally humble care, um, specifically in the context of addressing vaccine confidence. And so it sounds like the strategy has somewhat evolved since January 2021, but our confidence does remain in our CBOs. And so you, you mentioned T2, and so H&H &H recently announced that uh, T2 will continue as a public health core funded at $50 million to address community-based health care needs, building off of the COVID-19 response infrastructure. The community-based organizations funded through T2 are currently involved in steering outreach and policy recommendations via a community advisory board, a CAB, created as part of T2 and H&H. &H. So what role will these CBOs play in the public health core and how will their feedback and expertise be implemented moving forward? Um, thank you so much for this very important question. I'll start and then turn to Dr. Wallach again for anything to add. Um, and if you'll allow me, uh, Madam Chair, I want to say just a word about uh, the Public Health Corps because it is an idea that I am so passionate about. Um, the Public Health Corps is our once in a generation opportunity to reimagine public health for New York City. Um, it is a partnership, uh, you know, led um, within city government between the health department and health and hospitals. But as you alluded to, um, is really only as good as our partnerships with community-based organizations. So the Public Health Corps will build upon all of the work that has been done during COVID-19 response, where we've worked with about 65 community-based organization partners to date. Um, that includes the T2 um, CBOs, as well as uh, additional CBOs that we've engaged through an initiative called the Vaccine uh, Equity uh, partner engagement initiative um, and building upon that strong foundation to extend it still further, going from 65 community based organizations to um, nearly 100 uh, CBOs um, in uh, the full fledged uh, version of the Public Health Corps. Um, we uh, have allocated um, $60 million on uh, the work to date to community based organizations. Um, and again, we'll build upon that um, with, uh, you know, with additional funding in the months and the years ahead through the Public Health Corps. Um, so the Community Advisory Board has been, you know, a particularly important part of uh, T2. Um, there are countless examples where we've gotten direct feedback, you know, through that mechanism that has then informed our strategies, whether on testing or on vaccination. Um, and so that is also something that uh, we will uh, continue with, um, you know, in some form with respect to ensuring that community feedback and accountability is central to the public health core. I'll turn it to Dr. Wallach if he wants to add anything. Yeah, thank you, Commissioner. I would just uh, reiterate what you said of the importance of our partnerships with the CBOs uh, who have boots on the ground uh, and I'm very pleased uh, as we move forward with the public health core here in the city. Uh, so nothing more to add. So how can the city support CBOs who continue to respond to an exceptionally high demand for their services during this transition from T2 to the public health core? Is the city considering extending T2 contracts? Um, Dr. Wallach, do you want to start on that one? Uh, I think he's waiting to be unmuted.
Yes, thank you uh, for unmuting me. Apologies uh, for that. Uh, indeed, uh, we feel it is very important uh, to have the role, as I said, of the CBOs uh, and make sure that patients are connected uh, with those organizations uh, and can continue uh, to support their work. Uh, I don't have specific information uh, about the details of ongoing contracts, uh, but uh, again, would just emphasize the importance of their role in connecting patients to care. And Madam Chair, I'll just add briefly to say, um, you know, I know that uh, Health and Hospitals has had already amended the contract scope, um, you know, for uh, T2 CBOs, for example, to include vaccination among the deliverables. So it's a very, you know, tangible example of the ways in which um, this has been uh, dynamic uh, as part of, of the needs as they arise during um, COVID-19 response. Um, we have already built on the T2 CBO infrastructure through um, that program that I mentioned, the Vaccine Equity Partner Engagement Program, which allocated an additional $9 million to our CBO partners. Um, and uh, as I said, the Public Health Corps will give us a chance to extend this even further. Thank you for that. And so some of you know the population clearly that we're trying to reach our oldest New Yorkers, our elders. And as I mentioned in my opening remarks, New Yorkers aged 85 years and older have the lowest vaccination rates of all age groups with only 58% fully vaccinated. What are the greatest challenges in reaching this population? Yes, thank you for, um, for this important question as well. Um, it is one that we have, uh, had a lot of concerted attention paid to because we know just how important vaccination is for older New Yorkers in particular, given that age uh, along with vaccination status are the two most important risk factors for severe outcomes from COVID-19 disease. Um, there are several ways in which we have worked to improve these vaccination rates. Um, one is the in-home vaccination program that I mentioned, which has reached over 27,000 New Yorkers now. Um, many of them are uh, the ones who um, have uh, you know, limited mobility, uh, weren't able to get to our vaccination sites, even though we now have a vaccination site within a half mile of every New Yorker. Um, in some cases, uh, you know, particularly for our oldest New Yorkers, it would be very difficult even to, you know, to navigate that far to a site. So our in-home vaccination program has been critically important from that perspective. We've also worked with geriatricians around New York City. Geriatricians, as you well know, uh, are the doctors who uh, specialize in taking care of our oldest New Yorkers. So we've worked in partnership with them to make sure they know how to access vaccination, supplied them with vaccine, so that they can vaccinate their own patients when they see them in clinic um, and also ask them for you know, additional input on what else we can do to reach them. Finally, I'll say that um, you know, we've done uh, a proactive nurse outreach to our oldest New Yorkers. Um, we, we find that particularly because older New Yorkers are more likely to have underlying health conditions, they often have very specific clinical questions about those underlying health conditions and whether or not vaccination is recommended. Um, I wanna be very clear here that uh, in virtually all cases, the COVID-19 vaccine is strongly recommended and in fact is even more important for people who have underlying health conditions. But that conversation, you know, being able to ask detailed questions uh, to a nurse um, and having access to a doctor when needed as well uh, has also been critically important. So, um, you know, we, we do want to get that rate up as high as it possibly can, but those are some of the ways in which we've tried to address it. Of course, and anyone who, you know, can be vaccinated, we hope they will be. I, I guess my, my last question is, what is the city doing to address stigmatizing shaming, polarizing, or scapegoating of people that are unvaccinated? Thank you. This is an important question and is becoming, you know, more, um, more salient, uh, particularly with the advent of vaccine requirements. Um, my starting point, uh, again, is, is very similar to um, the, the way that I approach my, my own patients who are unvaccinated. Uh, it's, we have to start with empathy. We have to start with humility, as you have said as well. 
Um, there are often uh, valid reasons why um, people have deferred vaccination. And we have to listen and sit with that and understand uh, people's values and preferences, even as we do take a strong approach to getting as many people vaccinated as possible. I do believe that um, this is emblematic of New York City in so many ways, you know, to have that empathy, but also to be pioneering, you know, with respect to making sure that, um, that we do bring to bear vaccine requirements to get more New Yorkers vaccinated. Uh, so these are two things that we'll have to hold in our hands together at the same time. Um, but I'm confident that we can reach even more unvaccinated New Yorkers through the approaches that we've described. Agreed. I think this is incredibly important. Um, so I want to thank you for answering my questions. Absolutely, we we are we are your partners, and we want to do what's best for the city, of course, in in the mission of of public service. So thanks again to all of you for being here. And with that, I'll turn it back over to committee council. Thank you so much, Chair Rivera. Uh, and we'll next turn to council members for their questions. I just want to remind council members if they have a question to please use the Zoom raise hand function and I'll call on you in the order that you've raised your hand. Um, we're also going to be limiting council member questions to five minutes and the, the sergeant at arms will keep a timer to let you know when your time is up. Uh, for council member questions, the order that I have is council member Salamanca followed by council member Levin who I believe dropped off for a minute and then came back on um, and then council member Brooks Powers. So council member Salamanca when you're ready you can begin. Start in time. Uh, how are you? Thank you. Um, good afternoon, Commissioner. Um, Commissioner, I uh, my question is, I, I was between committees. Um, I didn't get to hear your entire statement regarding my bill, uh, regarding the waiving the fee for the, um, the death certificates. Um, is that something that your agency is supportive or not supportive of? Um, yes, Council Member Salamanca. Uh, the short answer is yes. Um, we strongly support uh, your bill, Intro 2373. And in fact, we're, we're prepared uh, to begin waiving fees uh, for the specific type of death certificate change that you've raised immediately. Um, this is something that we've been working on internally, and I, you know, I'm grateful for your leadership and moving it um, forward with the Council. Okay. Now, you know, I, I and I the reason this bill came out because I, I experienced going through this with my dad when he passed with COVID and I received this death certificate. Um, my question is, you know, is is it natural or is is it um, consistent whenever someone passes and they and they pass from um, from let's say a heart attack or diabetes or an, another other condition, um, uh, something else that on their death certificate it is. Um, it is indicated that they died of natural causes opposed to actually writing why why they physically what they physically uh, passed from uh, well first of all i'm i'm of course so sorry uh for your loss council member um and uh, you know it's uh too, too many uh families like yours have uh have had to suffer uh, over the course of this pandemic um, and I'm grateful that you're raising these issues because um, I know that for grieving families, you know, it's the last thing that they want to um, to navigate um, the challenges of, uh, you know, of the paperwork of death certificates. So with respect to your specific question, um, the way that uh, death certification works, um, it starts, uh, you know, with a the physician um, who, uh, you know, who pronounces a patient. Uh, and based on you know, their um, clinical experience, uh, they fill out the death certificate um, in terms of the causes of death. Uh, you know, rarely uh, will it be solely um, the notion of natural causes. Usually there is a specific clinical reason that is delineated uh, that is thought to be you know, most associated with the death of a given patient. All right. Well, thank you very much, Commissioner. And I am um, I'm excited to hear that, you know, your agency is supportive of this. Hopefully we can get this passed as soon as possible. Um, and, and we can start with the process of waiving the fees so that families can um, not have to worry about this financial burden uh, and get the proper documentation. Uh, because, as you know, FEMA is not releasing any funds uh, to these families unless their documentation is very specific on a COVID related death. Thank you again, council member. Thank you, commissioner. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, Mr. Chairs. 
Thank you, Council Member Salamanca. We'll next turn to Council Member Levin, followed by Council Member Brooke Powers. Council Member Levin, you can begin when you're ready. Thank you so much. Um, thank you very much, uh, Commissioner, for your testimony today, for answering our questions. Um, I um, First off, I want to commend um, the efforts of the Department of Health and the city for um, the public information campaign that you all have been doing in recent weeks. Um, I've seen the ads. I think they're very effective um, using real people with real people's experiences. Um, uh, the first question I have is, is um, what is the, uh, this, this came up during um, uh, one of the uh, ads um, that the, the patient was, uh, was waiting to hear from their primary care physician. Um, so my question is, what is the outreach looking like for, among primary care physicians in communities where we're seeing a low um, vaccination rate or on the low end of the vaccination rate? Or like, what, is, what are we asking of them? Uh, what are they asking of the city, um, the primary care physicians? Um, and, and what is the relationship or what are the efforts looking like to make sure that they are that they are giving that message because they are, I mean, there's trusted messengers, there's clergy, but primary care physicians, I think, are the most trusted. So thank you, Councilmember Levin, and and thanks for um, you know for the kudos on the public information campaign. Uh, the health department team uh, has dedicated uh, so much time and energy to it. It's something that we take extraordinarily seriously in terms of our responsibility during the pandemic. Uh, with respect to primary care physicians, uh, you said it very well. You know, we know from the history of vaccination campaigns that um, that a provider's strong recommendation is often the single greatest factor in being able to change someone's mind about vaccination. Um, and that's why we've had a real focus on this, um, you know, really starting uh, several months ago in terms of engaging uh, not just physicians and not just primary care physicians, but clinicians and, and healers, including non-traditional healers more broadly, because we know that um, they are the holders of trusted relationships with their own patients. Uh, so we did this, you know, first in um, May and June, we launched our Use Every Opportunity campaign, uh, which gave um, providers a toolkit, it gave them the information they needed, but also very specific information about how to have uh, effective vaccine conversations with their own patients. But we didn't rest with just putting that information um, you know, out into the world. Uh, we took a very boots on the ground approach. Uh, we visited over 2000 practices over the course of our vaccination campaign and actually sat with providers, particularly primary care doctors and family physicians um, to say, what are you hearing? What do you need? You know, how can we help? Um, and to give them uh, both supply of vaccine, but also you know, any other resources that they needed um, to be able to, uh, to speak with their patients. The last thing that I'll say is that um, we, we recently announced a $35 million um, physician referral program, which is the latest salvo in our Use Every Opportunity campaign. Uh, which essentially reimburses uh, providers for having vaccine conversations with their patients who remain unvaccinated. Uh, this is something really that okay. um, you know the state or federal government uh, should be uh, doing. Ought to be doing. Um, yeah, but I'm proud that the city has has led the way with it. Fantastic, um, Commissioner. I, I I have about a minute. I got two questions. So first question is: you you said this in your testimony. I want you to reiterate it. Um, do vaccine mandates work? Now we have some evidence. Do they work? Have they worked here? Yes, vaccine mandates work. Right. Okay. I, I think that that is a really important uh, message that needs to get out. I, I was listening to a New York Times podcast where the title of the podcast was "Do Do Vaccine Mandates Work?" And the it seemed like the consensus of that podcast was that no, they don't work. And so I think that it's very important that I think opinion makers. Um, out there in, um, you know, in the media, in our communities, um, understand just exactly um, how effective these mandates have been with data that you now have that you can show. Um, and then before I before I go here, uh, for sure, um, 
I chair the General Welfare Committee. I'm very concerned about single adults in congregate shelters um, in the DHS system. Um, and um, I, I'm not sure if, I'm, my Time understanding expired. has been that it's, that it's DHS or DSS staff that has largely been doing the work of, of vaccine access within the congregate shelters. Um, I'll ask you, what is DOHMH doing? And can we please do more involving the public health for now um, uh, to be out there on site? I mean, I went to Wards Island a couple of weeks ago and I asked the provider, which was Health USA, you know, what's the vaccine, reg you know, what's the regimen here? And they said, well, somebody should be coming out in a couple of days, you know, and like, no, there's got to be somebody on site uh, where you have men in congregate settings, you know, 20 guys in a, in a, in a dormitory setting. There's got to be somebody that's on site all the time having these one on one conversations. So just everything you've been talking about, which is that, you know, listening and hearing what they're saying. Because the vaccination rates, I think, I mean, I don't know if you could tell me what the vaccination rate is among single adults in shelter, um, but um, it's, 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 not, it's not high enough, as we know. Yes. Well, thank you for raising this. This is a, an incredibly important issue. Um, and it is one that the health department has been working with our colleagues in um, DHS uh, to, um, to improve vaccination rates, you know, among uh, people experiencing homelessness and particularly people uh, who are in shelter. Um, I will say, you know, I'll defer to, to DHS on, on the latest numbers, um, but I, I do know that those numbers have improved uh, in recent weeks. Um, and that's been uh, through concerted efforts, um, both to improve uh, access to vaccination and our colleagues at Test and Trace, uh, you know, have been vital for that. Um, but also um, in terms of building vaccine confidence and bringing, as you heard me say before, you know, those two halves uh, together. So we, we have done, you know, a number of, uh, of specific um, outreach events. Uh, we've had vaccination on site and that happens on a revolving basis, uh, you know, at um, DHS shelters. Um, but our work is not done to your point. And so, you know, we will continue to uh, to make sure that this remains a priority for us. One thing that I'll mention is that we do have an open RFP now um, called COVID Vaccine Confidence Educators. Uh, this is in partnership with the Department of Homeless Services. Um, and these are our contracts you know, for CBOs uh, to offer education um, against COVID-19 vaccine misinformation uh, to both residents and staff at DHS congregate facilities um, particularly shelters and safe havens uh, to improve vaccine confidence uh, across the shelter system. Uh, it looks like council member Levin has his hand up, but we can come back for a second round. Um, we'll next turn to council member Brooks Powers. Uh, who has her hand up. And I just want to remind any council member that has a question to please use the Zoom raise hand function at this time. Thank you. And council member Brooks Powers, you can begin when you're ready. Thank Starting you. Time. Thank you. So um, good afternoon and thank you to DOHMH and Health and Hospitals for being here to testify th today from this morning. <laughs> um, I'd like to also thank the committee chairs, Council Member Rivera and Le Levine for convening this important hearing. The issue of vaccine equity has seriously impacted the health of my constituents for um, the entire time I've been in office and it has been and continues to be a top concern. Our city has made great progress um, and as of this week, 63% of New Yorkers are fully vaccinated. But unfortunately, in my district, only about 47% of my constituents are fully vaccinated. Zip code 11691 in Far Rockaway has the lowest full vaccination rate in the city at 41%. These low rates are a result of a longstanding combination of conditions in our district, such as systemic inequity in healthcare access, vaccine hesitancy and mistrust, and a struggle to ensure an equitable distribution of government resources. 
COVID continues to threaten our communities, which is why the city urgently needs to reevaluate its approach to reaching unvaccinated people and protecting our most vulnerable neighbors. I'm eager to hear from DOHMH and Health and Hospitals and understand how these agencies are working to renew their vaccine efforts, especially because my office has been working extremely hard to coordinate with health and hospitals. And um, I've I find that there's a lot of con a lot of issues um, in trying to make that connection in my district. Um, mm -hmm. And before I get into the questions, I just briefly would like to speak in support of Councilmember Salamanca's bill, Intro 2373, for which I am a proud sponsor, co-sponsor. And I have received calls from constituents asking for help in obtaining um, these amended certificates. And we have seen firsthand the difficulty many people are facing especially early in the pandemic before COVID was more fully understood. Many death certificates were released without COVID-19 rightfully listed as the cause of death. And as a result, when FEMA began distributing funeral reimbursements earlier this year, many people were denied financial support for their loved ones, um, funerals for their loved ones' funerals because they could not show COVID as the cause of death. Um, and some have been facing administrative delays they are unable to get prompt help and they have struggled to obtain both the financial compensation and the closure they are looking for. I think this bill is the right thing to do for the families who have lost loved ones due to COVID. And I encourage my co colleagues to sign on and help pass um, this legislation. So I'm gonna jump into the questions um, and look forward to hearing the responses. Um, the first one is how, and I, I'll ask all of them together just so that I can maximize my time. So how does DOHMH's equity action plan differ from their past outreach efforts? What specific engagement initiatives are DOHMH and Health and Hospital using to reach uniquely vulnerable and vaccine hesitant populations? What will the agencies do to target efforts in specific areas of the city where vaccination rates are lagging? Can DOHMH or Health and Hospital provide information on the effectiveness of the city's vaccine ban program, um, how agencies are prioritizing events in less vaccinated areas of the city versus those um, that have more, and then do the agencies track how many vaccinations are administered at each event? And I will say before um, allowing the responses to those questions, the concern that I have with my um, with the with my office engagement with health and hospital right now has been um, the inability to secure enough vaccine vans in my district. Um, I hear, you know, the need for racial justice. I hear the need for um, a campaign to target um, low vaccinated communities, but the action I do not see. And I think it's highly problematic and disingenuous to put forth um, the perception that we are doing all that we can to create access to the vaccine mm -hmm. when I have not seen that in action. When the vaccine first came um, aboard, my constituents were asked to be um, mobilized to York College for 40 minutes outside of our community. Um, the only permanent vaccine site was in my neighboring I'm council fine. members um, district, which was not where um, you, we needed it, where 11691 was the second deadliest zip code. So the fact of the matter remains that the city continues to fail to provide adequate um, resources to my constituency and constituencies such as mine that really need to have proper access to the, um, these resources. So thank you so much. Um, thank you, council member. Uh, and you know, I, I hear the, uh, the urgency and the passion uh, in your remarks. Um, and so allow me to try to, um, to cover some of your questions at least um, you know, with my response. Uh, and the, the starting point is really, you know, to reaffirm uh, just how important uh, equity is as a pillar of our vaccination campaign. Um, the health department uh, recognized this early on in our COVID response. Um, it's why the equity action plan that you mentioned was released in June of 2020. 
Um, but then we followed that up with a vaccine equity strategy that was released in December of 2020 uh, at the very inception of our vaccination campaign. Um, and that laid out you know, the core pillars of our approach, uh, which were around uh, improving access, um, ensuring uptake, particularly by building vaccine uh, confidence, uh, but then holding ourselves accountable to the bottom line outcomes, uh, particularly in um, the places and among the demographic groups where vaccination rates uh, were lower. Um, what we found is that the way to address this is um, by taking uh, a data-driven approach and combining it with a very you know, local um, way of uh, delivering resources to the ground. Uh, and by resources, I mean that very broadly. I'm talking about vaccines, but also uh, the outreach, you know, the canvassers that I mentioned, the phone calls, the materials, um, and then, you know, the science-based information, uh, and then working hand-in-hand -hand with community partners, uh, as, as you've already heard me um, talk about. Um, I'll just say a little bit more about the way in which our community engagement and outreach teams work. Um, and particularly to highlight um, the ways in which, uh, you know, we have taken um, place-based approaches across the entire city. Uh, for example, sometimes through our neighborhood health action centers, um, which, uh, you know, is, is particularly emblematic of our commitment to uh, marginalized communities um, and ensuring that uh, we're building from a foundation that is not just in times of crisis, but is actually there um, between crises as well. Um, for, you know, for your constituents, for the specific zip code uh, that you mentioned, um, that has been a particular focus uh, with respect to um, lowering barriers to access uh, and particularly working with community-based physicians um, in, in that zip code as well. Um, we've also brought to bear uh, our incentives, uh, ensuring that people know about our in-home vaccination uh, program, um, bringing transportation, you know, for people who aren't able to get to a site, uh, as well as having several community conversations, uh, you know, among groups in, um, in, in the area that you represent, uh, as well as pop-ups with houses of worship. So um, hopefully that gives you a little bit of a sense of the work that has happened, um, but you have my commitment, and I'm sure Dr. Wallach's as well, uh, to uh, to continue those efforts so we can get as many people vaccinated as possible. I'll turn it to Dr. Wallach if he wants to add anything from the health and hospital side. Thank you, uh, Commissioner, and thank you, Council Member, uh, for your thoughtful uh, question. Indeed, I apologize that you feel uh, that we have not had adequate uh, mobile vans uh, in your zip codes and happy to follow up uh, with that. I will say that the test and trace core uh, here in New York City has over 30 mobile vans, and then there are an additional 10 vans uh, through some of our sister agencies that are out on the streets every day uh, providing vaccine uh, to those who need it. And to Dr. Chokshi's uh, point, we really use information uh, based on vaccine rates in particular neighborhoods to help us uh, come up with our schedule uh, on a weekly basis. So absolutely happy to take that back, uh, but rest assured, we are committed uh, to making sure that vaccines uh, get into the arms of those that are most vulnerable uh, and need it. So thank you. And I'll just add briefly, you know, I know that um, actually Dr. Torian Easterling, who uh, serves as the chief equity officer and first deputy commissioner for the health department um, is, uh, is in your zip code, is in 11691 this afternoon for an event with borough president um, Richards as well. And we're happy to, to partner uh, further on on events or anything else that um, that may help. Thank you, Council Member Brooks Powers. And it appears that both Council Member Levin and Brooks Powers have very brief follow up questions. So we'll put a two minute clock on, um, and you can both ask questions very quickly. Council Member Levin, you can begin as soon as you're ready. Time starts now. Thank you so much, um, Commissioner. I just I would I just wanted to um, mention um, that it might be helpful in that open RFP to do um, to make sure that that organizations that that do healthcare um, for the homeless population in New York City are aware of that um, open RFP. So, Floating Hospital, Care for the Homeless, uh, Coalition for the Homeless. Um, um, that I think would be 
uh, very important, you know, and, and other homeless services providers that, 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 um, that may be interested in this. But um, I just I just wanted to emphasize just how how, how important it's, it, it needs it is to make sure that it's that somebody's on site and during at regular times that and for extended periods of time so that um, so that people that are residing in these congregate shelters are um, you know have more than just one short opportunity um, to get vaccinated. I'm 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 very concerned um, about um, the dangers of of, of Delta. Um, you know, as, as you know, I mean, and I, I mean, if you go to Ward's Island, you'll see that there's, um, you know, the beds are not six feet apart. Uh, obviously, nobody can sleep with a mask on. Um, and there's, you know, 20, 20 guys per, um, per room. These are big rooms, but it's not, it is not a, a, a safe situation. And frankly, like the decision that to move people back into congregate from the hotels was made prior to Delta and was kind of a different situation. And so, you know, it's, I think that it's really important that we try to get those vaccination rates higher. Do, do you know off the top of your head, just what the vaccination rate is for single adults in shelter? Um, thank you, Councilor Levin. Uh, no, that, that's something that I'll have to defer to our Department of Homeless Services colleagues. Um, I do know that it has improved in recent weeks, you know, thanks to, mm -hmm. uh, to some of the efforts that I mentioned, but your point is very well taken. Um, you know, we have to get uh, vaccination rates as high uh, as they possibly can. Uh, and again, I know from my own clinical practice that people experiencing homelessness are, um, you know, at uh, at higher risk of severe outcomes um, from COVID-19. Uh, and so that, that lends uh, even more urgency to the efforts that you're calling attention to. Um, and thank you also for the feedback on the RFP. Um, I do know that we work closely with many of the organizations that you mentioned, but we will certainly confirm um, or redouble our efforts to make sure that they're aware of it. Street outreach teams as well. So that would be, you know, um, S uh, CUCS and and breaking ground and beers. Um, okay, thanks so much. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Council Member Levin. And we'll briefly now turn back to Council Member Brooks Powers for two minute follow up. Time starts now. Um, thank you. And just wanted to end off by saying thank you um, both for your response. Um, I will say though, I would like to have a commitment from you both to have your. Um, appropriate staff work with my staff um, to really implement um, a plan where we may have to come back and, and do a fine tuning if it doesn't work. I know I've been working closely with your team, um, which in some cases have been extremely helpful in some cases um, with some that it has not been. And so I wanna cut through the red tape so that we can get this shot in the arm um, for people in my district who would like that. Um, so I really would like to have a firm commitment on that um, and offline, if you can have someone reach out so we know who that appropriate contact is. We've changed and had iterations of it a couple of times. And um, again, my office, we've even launched what's called Vaccination Sundays. It's something that I kicked off over the summer and it has not been able to be as effective as I think it could be because each weekend we don't know if we're gonna get a van no matter how early in advance we um, give that information to. And sometimes we'll find out um, on the Friday before the Sunday, not giving the, the faith-based leader enough time to promote it into their community. Also, I'm hearing from local um, organizations in terms of the RFP opportunities um, that we should have and if possible, remove even that rep tape of a RFP when you have partners that in the beginning of the testing and the vaccine that you were locating in some of these facilities and working with some of these community partners to make them then have to go through an RFP process when they've been partners from the very um, beginning um, seems a bit unfair. And so I did wanna use this opportunity to bring that up on their behalf as well. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. And, and the answer is yes, without hesitation, Sorry. we have our commitment. Um, and uh, we will certainly uh, do everything that we can to work with you. And I just want to thank you for your conviction, you know, in, in addressing 
uh, vaccination rates in your community. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, council member. Uh, and seeing no further questions from council members, I next wanna to turn to chairs Levine and then Rivera for closing remarks for this panel. Well, thank you to our colleagues for those excellent questions. And thank you, Dr. Chachki and Dr. Wallach for uh, being with us today and for your work on these issues. Uh, an excellent discussion, which we look forward to continuing. Thank you so much. Chair Rivera. Thank you to you all for being here. Um, I know we mentioned a lot of things in terms of next steps and how to avoid polarizing conversations and stereotypes. So looking forward to working with you going, just going forward. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, chairs. And thank you very much to the administration for this panel. We'll next turn to the public. I'd like to remind everyone that all public testimony will be limited to three minutes. After I call your name, please wait a brief moment for the Sergeant at Arms to announce that you may begin before starting your testimony. Please note that the panelists will be able to register uh, for about another 50 minutes for this hearing. The first panel will be Andrew Van Ostrand, followed by Tidy Abreu, followed by Chris Norwood, followed by Michelle Jackson. And Andrew, you can begin as soon as the Sergeant cues you. Time starts now. Thank you so much. I hope everybody can hear me. Uh, and I wanna thank uh, the council, uh, the commissioner, Department of Health and other city leadership for not only this hearing, but for their continued dogged, uh, appreciated work on all of these important issues. Uh, I'm head of government affairs with an organization called One Medical. I don't have a lot of time, so I'll give you a brief overview of who One Medical is for those that may not be familiar. We operate uh, a bricks and mortar primary care offices in about 15 states across the country. In addition to employing thousands of primary care doctors, as well as NPs, PAs, mental health providers, and other clinicians, we also operate a virtual and telehealth technology enabled uh, network that reaches patients in nearly all 50 states. Uh, New York is our second largest market. We've been in New York operating primary care clinics now for the better part of a decade. We have 17 bricks and mortar offices in Manhattan and Brooklyn uh, with six focused pediatric uh, offices, which we also call family offices. We have four new offices uh, in the works right now, uh, which we hope will be built and fully operational uh, by the end of the first quarter of 2022. In New York City, we serve over 150,000 New York residents uh, as patients, meaning that their primary care is grounded with a clinician at one of our offices. And even in the midst of the pandemic, up through the end of uh, July of this year, we were averaging about 18,000 in-person visits a month. Uh, from our perspective, this is a huge, huge opportunity uh, to help the city meet their goal uh, of expanding vaccinations not only COVID vaccinations and potentially boosters and third shots, but also routine vaccinations, uh, enabling childhoods back to school vaccinations and ensuring folks are receiving and accessing the deferred care that they may have put off uh, because of uh, very real concerns related to the pandemic. The simple reality, however, is, is that we've, we have not been able to get the access to COVID vaccines as we would have liked. We only give, have given about 500 COVID vaccines in our offices even though we have been repeatedly uh, asking for additional vaccines as well as testing supplies and have continued to raise our hand to do more uh, to help ensure uh, all of those issues I just mentioned, that we're being part of that solution. I'll highlight that earlier in the year, we did partner with the city on getting 7,000 shots as well as thousands of COVID tests uh, within the New York City shelter population, something we're very proud of and something we'd love to do more of. Uh, the city decided to go in a different direction uh, by consolidating some of the other partners and vendors they were using. Um, but it's an example of the work that we stand ready uh, to help the city with um, and the services that we're able to provide if given the opportunity. I will say primary care, as uh, Council Member Lewin and Dr. Wallach have mentioned, these are the trusted clinicians that can help build confidence in vaccines. Um, and we would love to put our clinicians in sites to work for the city and continue to be seen as a partner. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll next turn to Tidy Abreu, and you can begin as soon as the sergeant cues you. Time starts now. 
Thank you to Chair Rivera and Chair Levine and to the council members present. My name is Tidy Abreu and as the policy analyst for the Hispanic Federation, I'm here to advocate for Latinos across New York City. For months, NYC has struggled to improve vaccination rates in communities of color. However, recent data illustrates a stark difference. According to the NYC Test and Trace Corps, 50.8% of Latino residents have received at least one dose of the vaccine as of mid-August versus 49.52% of white residents. This is a vast improvement from earlier this summer when just over a third of Latino residents received the vaccine and white residents were about 10 points ahead. However, nearly 50% of Latinos still do not have a vaccine and the pace of vaccination is lagging, particularly in predominantly Hispanic neighborhoods in Brooklyn, Queens, the Bronx, and Upper Manhattan. In an effort to meet this need, Hispanic Federation has engaged in several initiatives. And for the sake of time, I'll just, I'll, I'll just explain two of them. So targeted outreach has proven to be an effective vaccination strategy and Hispanic Federation has hosted uh, a special COVID-19 outreach and vaccination event uh, that was co-sponsored by the New York State Department of Health, the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs, and one of our member agencies, Vision Urbana. And in the span of just a few hours, we were able to vaccinate about 50 residents in the NYCHA Baruch houses in the Lower East Side. They received their first dose of the vaccine and were given appointments for a second dose. Additionally, hundreds of households in each of these buildings received critical bilingual informational brochures and event flyers. Um, and besides uh, also administering the vaccine, we were able to provide groceries for over 500 families. Um, in uh, just last week, Hispanic Federation also launched an eight week public education campaign called La Vacuna Para Todos or the Vaccine for All with the goal of addressing widespread misinformation and providing vaccine education that is both culturally and linguistically accessible where Latinos live. The campaign encompasses television, radio, digital, and includes an LED display vehicle that drives around specific communities with our ads that includes HF's hotline number, which is available to our community to answer any questions individuals have about the vaccine. We also use geo-targeting to reach specific zip codes with low vaccination numbers. Hispanic Federation is strongly committed to ensuring our community is educated and vaccinated. We urge City Council to continue supporting efforts to debunk myths about the vaccine and to vaccinate as many residents as possible. Uh, when the vaccine becomes available to young children, accessible information disseminated, disseminated by credible messengers is crucial for parents and guardians to feel comfortable vaccinating their kids. And to equitably address the vaccination rates of Latinos in our city, we must address access to health care. Uh, for the sake of time, I'll conclude my comments. Thank you so much for hearing our testimony. Thank you so much. And just a reminder to everyone that you can submit a lengthier written testimony uh, and it will be included in the record as well. Uh, we'll next call on Chris Norwood, who can begin as soon as the sergeant cues you. Time starts now. Uh, you're still, oh, there you go. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, wait. I'm Chris Norwood, Executive Director of Health People and representing Communities Driving Recovery. Uh, the Test and Trace Corps, which H&H &H and the Health Department formed, uh, they deserve great credit for doing that. It is an extraordinary coalition of 35 community groups across the boroughs. It built a community infrastructure that is unique and never existed before, which has been vital to New York City's high level of COVID testing prevention and the increased focus on vaccination. Having these groups already in place is also vital to COVID recovery. These are CBOs already organized into a health mission uh, with H&H &H and the health department and with local staff representing a range of populations, neighborhoods, and languages who can rapidly be trained and mobilized to start the fight against the city's massive ill health, especially diabetes and the other chronic disease that so clearly 
and so fatally fueled this epidemic. New York City had a 356% increase in diabetes deaths in the first COVID surge, triple any place else in the nation, but the city is still not funding well-proven diabetes prevention and self-care programs in these stricken neighborhoods. We need not just vaccine equity, we need equity and recovery. And that cannot happen without enabling communities to start effective programs to slash chronic disease. There is no more terrible historical mistreatment in health and public health than the failure to do what is really, really possible to slash this chronic disease. The Test and trace groups totally need to be recognized as part of the city's public health core. I don't think we received a conclusive answer this morning uh, when Council Member Rivera asked. On the one hand, it seemed Dr. Chosky was saying that would happen, but there was not a clear answer from H and H, and those contracts must be extended through H and H because that's where they are now. I want to just give one example from my own group of what can happen and what we can do. We seem to have no real, it's so hard to recognize what has drastically happened to the health of the city. My own group in the, group in the South Bronx through special federal funding, which no longer exists, engaged almost 2000 people on Medicaid and the diabetes self-management course, a six session course that helps reduce everything from blood sugar and complications to depression. Early reports in the epidemic made it very clear that it wasn't having diabetes that killed with COVID. If blood sugar was in control, people did fairly well. The higher the blood sugar, the more deaths. I think how many people with those 2000 people were protected and we didn't even know it at the time, but now we know it and we're still not doing anything but I can assure you that work in the South Bronx was done by the community. I'm it was done by peer educators. Um, I'll, I'll stop almost immediately, but we can train groups across the city to do the same thing. And the community will come out and do it itself, just like they did in the South Bronx when they had the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much. And our final panelist for this panel will be Michelle Jackson, and you can begin as soon as you're ready. Time starts now. Good morning, after, uh, good afternoon, Chairs Rivera and Levine. My name is MJ Okuma, filling in for Michelle Jackson, who is the Executive Director of the Human Services Council, a membership organization representing over 170 human services providers. Since the vaccine rollout began, human service providers have been close partners to the city by acting as trusted and culturally complement um, information sources for New Yorkers who are vaccine hesitant and providing venues for permanent and pop-up vaccine sites. Our members overwhelmingly support the vaccine and testing mandate. And while we stand behind the science and necessity of these vaccines, medical racism continues to cast a long shadow on many of our communities. Because of this, for now, having the vaccine or testing mandate helps provide flexibility for organizations based on their unique communities and workforces. However, there have been real challenges in implementation. Providers were given different dates on when to come into compliance and early guidance was either not available or not complete. Clarity about how to comply is especially needed for those who receive funding from city, state, and federal contracts, which all have different sets of guidances. Additionally, many human services providers were already struggling with high vacancy rates and turnover before this mandate due to low wages and chronic underfunding. There is growing concern about how um, to maintain services if staff decides to walk away because of the vaccine man and testing mandate, especially for jobs like administrative staff, security, and building services workers who can more easily find jobs outside the sector where a mandate is not in place. City human services contracting agencies need uniform direction um, to work with providers to decrease caseloads and deliverables if there is not enough staff to maintain them, and also allow them to be flexible in spending if providers propose offering bonuses, higher salaries, or other benefits to attract and maintain workers. These essentially essential workers deserve fair pay wages under city contracts. Um, and this shows that you know it's an equity issue, but it's also a health issue for our communities. Um, we look forward to working um, with the city on this important issue and are thankful for the council, MOX, and the office of the Deputy Mayor of Health and Human Services for creating spaces like this for feedback and partnership on such an important issue. Thank you so much for the opportunity to testify. Thank you very much. Uh, and we'll now turn to Chair Rivera who has some questions for this panel. 
I wanted to just thank you all, well, for being here and, and for being honest about what we can do to improve. And of course, we're here because we're supposed to provide oversight over the agencies that serve New Yorkers. So I guess I want to ask you and, and maybe uh, uh, Ms. Norwood or, or whoever, how can the city support community-based organizations and ensuring they have both the capacity and resources to serve their respective communities. And if it's a matter of funding, is this conversation with target communities a long-term conversation requiring funding spread out over time? versus large one-time infusions or contracts? Uh, we can begin with MJ as um, they're on, they're no longer on mute and then we'll turn to Chris. Yeah, no, thank you, I'm sure Vera for that, for that question. I think there, there is, when it comes to maintaining staff, like when there is time, times of crisis, like we've seen during the COVID-19 pandemic, I think it is an issue of, of long-term funding and kind of the chronic low wages that human services workers get um, under city and state contracts, which makes it a little bit harder, you know, when things get more difficult for folks to want to stay in those positions. So I think there is a there is an answer of long-term funding when it comes to, you know, resources needed to implement this mandate and like respond in the moment now while we work on those long-term solutions. I think, you know, if the city could really work to provide really close and consistent guidance across all agencies, um, if the city is able to do some of the work of comparing city, state, and federal guidances and being very clear to providers of when they differ, which one has precedence over the other, and how they can be in full compliance so each individual organization doesn't have to do that work themselves, that would be really helpful in just making sure that people, but providers know that they have the right information and they're complying in accordance to, to all the different guidances. Thank you, MJ. And we'll turn to Chris now to answer the question, followed by Tidy. Thank you. Yes, yes, I think it is long term. And that's why I sincerely hope that all these T2 uh, CBO workers don't all get fired at Christmas this year, which will be a real blow in looking at what they did. And, you know, it wasn't appreciated. But now certain things are in place. And if we can keep them in place, and I really appreciate this hearing because it's focused on that. If we can keep them in place, we can go forward to do this other work. We're still sitting here. The city is, is so much sicker than it was before the epidemic. Type two diabetes has even doubled among people under age 20. That's not supposed to happen. They'll be on dialysis before they're out of their 20s. And we have to all focus, keep in place, stabilize these organizations and go forward and do the work they can really do. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and we'll now turn to Tidy to answer the question as well. And so I echo um, what the other two panelists said, uh, definitely long-term funding is needed um, and very clearly delineated timelines for the funding. Uh, for instance, uh, the Hispanic Federation has a partnership with New York State where we're doing regranting to our member agencies that are doing this work in, uh, you know, throughout communities in New York City and the state. Um, and they're, you know, we're able to, to give them funding for 18 to 24 months to continue doing this work. And they know that they can utilize this funding, not just for the programming, but also to hire staff to sustain this work. And so they're, you know, they have the confidence that they'll they'll have enough capacity uh, to really serve their communities and ensure that they're being educated about the vaccine and receiving the vaccinations. Thank you so much, uh, and thank you to this entire panel. We'll now turn to our next panel, which includes the Jewish Orthodox Women's Medical Association, uh, and we don't have a name associated with that organization. So um, when you testify, please make sure to include your name for the record followed by Kaveri Sengupta, followed by Kevin Jones, followed by Ali Baum, uh, and the Jewish Orthodox Women's Medical Association. You can begin as soon as the Sergeant cues you. Time starts now. Good afternoon, and thank you for this opportunity. My name is Dr. Sarah Becker, and I'm the chair of JOMA's COVID-19 Vaccine Education Task Force. 
The Jewish Orthodox Women's Medical Association, or JOMA, is comprised of women physicians from across the Jewish Orthodox continuum who volunteer their time to provide health education to the Jewish community. To that end, we have been working with the Orthodox communities around vaccination since our inception in 2019. During the measles epidemic, in partnership with New York City Department of Health and the CDC Foundation, we created a vaccine hotline to answer questions and arrange for in-home vaccination. This led to the birth of the Preventative Health Education Series, which to date has had over 20,000 podcast downloads and thousands of calls to our hotline where talks are available to those without internet access. With the advent of the COVID-19 vaccines, our organization continues its work encouraging vaccination within Orthodox communities. In addition to releasing scores of talk with with vaccine experts on our platforms. Since March, we have co-hosted eight virtual town halls to answer COVID-19 vaccine questions. Live participants for each event range from hundreds to thousands of viewers with many more re-watching on YouTube. Topics covered include vaccine development and mechanism of action, safety and efficacy, and debunking the infertility myth to name but a few. Additionally, we have used print advertisement and social media for education, including videos promoting vaccination, which have garnered over 800,000 views since they were released in September 2021. And we have released mailed out, recently mailed out posters and brochures to medical offices in Orthodox zip codes across New York City with the help of the DOH. Our latest project is a confidential hotline where community members can call in six days a week to have their questions answered anonymously by medical professionals. There is an age old expression that a lie can get halfway around the globe while the truth is still putting on his shoes. We were fortunate to have gotten out our message early about vaccine safety and efficacy, but unfortunately the growing and well-funded anti-vax movement has specifically targeted our community with anti-vax misinformation. Countless mailings have been sent to various Jewish Orthodox communities downplaying the COVID-19 virus as just a cold and a hoax and claiming severe and permanent side effects from vaccination. The top questions we continue to receive are about vaccine safety, specifically, does the vaccine cause infertility or damage pregnancies? And additionally, why should I vaccinate if I already had COVID? There remains a strong need for culturally sensitive education and additional resources to combat misinformation in our communities. Funding and support from New York City are critical at this time. Thank you for your attention and assistance. Thank you very much, Dr. Becker. And we'll next turn to Kaveri Sengupta. And you can begin as soon as the sergeant cues you. Starting time. Good afternoon. My name is Kaveri Sengupta. I am the education policy coordinator at CACF the Coalition for Asian American Children and Families. Um, thank you to Chair Levine, Chair Rivera, and members of the Committees on Health and Hospitals for giving us this opportunity to, to testify. Bringing together over 70 Asian American Pacific Islander led and serving organizational members and partners for almost 35 years, CACF has led the fight in New York City for improved and equitable policy systems and services to support those mar most marginalized in AAPI communities. AAPIs are the fastest growing population in, in New York City, with initial results from the 2020 census data revealing that we comprise nearly 16% of the city. To address ongoing issues of vaccine equity and confidence, and by extension, other health needs of the AAPI community, we recommend that the city take four key steps. First, implement data disaggregation across city agencies involved in health outreach, especially on languages spoken. Although the overall vaccination rate for New York City residents identifying as Asian is 71.4%, which is leading all racial groups in the city, the data that we have access to about our community is mostly aggregated, meaning that the diversity of and disparities within our communities are often shrouded by the catch-all category of Asian, failing to shed light on the various unique struggles among specific ethnic, Asian ethnic communities. Without disaggregated data, we don't know who in the remaining 28.6 of Asian New Yorkers may not be accessing vaccines. CACF also participated in H&H's Test and Trace Community Advisory Board and saw that much of the data from H&H erases our AAPI communities completely. When we don't have data that accurately re reflects our diverse communities, it's difficult to trust the vaccine data presented. According to an analysis into the impacts of COVID-19 on the AAPI community in New York City conducted by the NYU Center for the Study of Asian American Health last year, residents of Chinese descent had the highest mortality rate from COVID-19 in New York's public hospital system. South Asian New Yorkers experienced the second highest rates of positivity and hospitalization. 
These findings based on a systematic analysis of surnames of patients, not on granular disaggregated data by race, ethnicity, and languages spoken, should leave us all skeptical of the current overall vaccination rate for Asians in New York City. Secondly, it's critical for the city to support the development of high quality, consistent, accessible multimedia materials in multiple languages, including those supported by AAPI populations. Those, this includes low incidence languages that lie outside of the top 10 languages spoken in New York City. Throughout our work with or our organizational members, especially smaller CBOs working in low incidence language communities, we've learned about the lack of culturally competent tra translated materials available. Because of this gap, many CBOs are left to create their own in-language materials to communicate and phone vaccines. And seeing this gap, CACF partnered with CBOs to produce vaccine-related outreach materials in Chinese Mandarin and Cantonese, Korean, Punjabi, Urdu, Bangla, Vietnamese, Arabic, Nepali, and Japanese. Um, in this vein, to better reach all AAPI communities, the city must utilize its resources to expand the diversity of in-language translated materials and always work in partnership with CBOs. Do you mind if I just wrap up quickly? Um, uh, the city must also utilize its resources to expand the diversity of in-language translated materials and always work in partnership with CEOs for planning and strategy all the way to implementation. We also need the city to ensure consistent access to high quality interpretation services at vaccination sites throughout the city to help answer questions that non-English speaking API may have and to guide them through the vaccination process. It's also important to recognize that digital divide that exists for the API community where certain populations are unable to access remote interpretation services due to lack of digital literacy. And finally, the city's response to vaccine inequities and confidence and also the longer term recovery and healing of our communities must be rooted in a community led approach. As other folks have said, we join with the community's driving recovery campaign and many other health advocates to ask that critical CBOs, many who were part of the T2 efforts are considered part of the forward thinking public health core to fight this pandemic and to tackle many of the underlying social determinants of health that have fueled the pandemic. Small CBOs in our communities of color must have a productive role and their capacities must be built to serve as such for the equitable recovery of our communities. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And we'll now turn to Kevin Jones and you can begin as soon as the Sergeant cues you. Starting time. Uh, good morning, Chair Levine and Rivera, Chair Levine Rivera and members of the Committees on Health and Hospitals. Uh, my name is Kevin Jones. I'm the, I am AARP New York's Associate State Director for Advocacy covering New York City. And we represent approximately 750,000 AARP members across the five boroughs. Thank you for taking the time to um, uh, allow us to testify today um, on COVID-19 vaccine hesitancy and equity in New York City. Ever since the first COVID-19 vaccine received emergency use authorization from the FDA, AARP New York has been advocating to ensure New Yorkers have easy and equitable access to the COVID-19 vaccine. We have also worked hard to ensure that our members have access to the most accurate and reliable information on the COVID-19 vaccines. In the early stages of New York City's COVID-19 vaccine rollout, AARP voiced a number, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, voiced a number of our members' concerns to the City Council and City Hall regarding the city's vaccine appointment portal. We highlighted how the process to schedule an, an appointment disadvantaged large portions of older New Yorkers from getting a vaccine, largely due to the fact that many older adults did not have access to reliable internet service or the technological literacy needed to schedule an appointment. Since then, AARP New York has been focused on providing our members with readily accessible information on how and where they can schedule their vaccine appointments across New York, including uh, how to request in-home vaccinations for homebound seniors and answering a number of frequently asked questions to ensure that their vaccine appointments are as smooth and easy as possible. While 76% of New York City residents above the age of 65 are now fully vaccinated and 81% have at least uh, received at least one dose, we have seen an overall slowdown in the vaccination rate among this population in recent months, similar to the rest of the United States, in which 10 million older adults still have not received their full series of COVID-19 vaccinations. As most of us at this hearing already know, many health experts and officials have cited vaccine hesitancy, which encompasses a wide and complex range of concerns and beliefs about vaccines, as one of the primary causes for this slowdown among older adults. As a national organization, AARP has done considerable research on the issue of vaccine hesitancy among older adults, both amid the COVID-19 pandemic and in years prior. While this topic has garnered much attention over the past year and a half because of the seriousness of the ongoing pandemic, we have found that the hesitancy towards vaccines in general have been fairly common among a large portion of older adults in the United States for a myriad of reasons. 
According to our studies prior to the pandemic, we found that only 45% of adults above the age of 50 reported that they had gotten all the vaccinations that their doctor or healthcare provider recommended, and 26% reported that they had gotten few or none of the vaccines that were recommended to them. When we surveyed individual about individuals about why they were not likely to get the flu vaccine, for example, 41% of those surveys cited that they were concerned about side effects of the vaccine. And additionally, more than half of those surveys stated that they did not know who to trust for re reliable information, even about the flu vaccine. Uh, in the fall of 2020, prior I'm to- Time expired. Uh, oh, I'm, I'm gonna skip to the end, but I'll uh, submit a longer um, portion. I just wanna say that we believe the city can do more to address the sentiments of vaccine hesitancy, and we continue to uh, improve the current vaccination rate among New Yorkers. Um, this would include um, utilizing its network of senior centers and community-based organizations. And again, I'm happy to take questions and I will submit a uh, longer version of this um, online as well. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Um, and before we turn to our next and final panelist, Ali Bohm, I just want to take a minute to remind everyone that if we've inadvertently missed you, please use the Zoom raise hand function if you plan to testify. Um, and our host will also be confirming that we have no additional registrants. Um, so with that, we'll turn to Ali and you can begin as soon as you're ready. Thank you. My name is Ali Bohm. I'm a policy counsel at the New York Civil Liberties Union. When Mayor de Blasio began announcing citywide vaccine mandates, he insisted that the city had done everything it could to achieve voluntary vaccination. This assertion is gallingly untrue. The initial vaccine rollout strategy focused on mass vaccination sites and the pharmacy network for vaccine delivery, a network that the city well knew was woefully inadequate in neighborhoods hardest hit by COVID-19. To provide but one illustration, District 16 in Brooklyn, which is home to the highest percentage of New York City's population living below the poverty line, until very recently had zero vaccination sites. Indeed, the initial vaccine rollout sidelined community-based organizations, safety net providers, senior centers, and others who are trusted providers for our Black, Latinx, Brown, immigrant, disabled, and low-income communities, and who know how to meet those communities where they are. Even when vaccination sites are available, too many New Yorkers fear that there will be negative immigration consequences associated with receiving a vaccine. Others, whether for fear of criminalization, having their children taken away, or any other reason, fear sharing personal information with the government or private companies to receive a vaccine. Although the city has broadcast messages about immigration status on Link NYC kiosks, the city and state have done precious little when it comes to implementing legally binding privacy protections. In addition, too many people have been turned away from vaccination sites because they lack identification. And some low-income New Yorkers remain unvaccinated because they cannot afford to take time off from work to recover from vaccine side effects. The city has also been aware of well-founded vaccine skepticism rooted in a long history of medical experimentation, forced sterilizations, and other medical mistreatment in Black, Indigenous, Latinx, Brown, immigrant, disabled, and low-income communities in the United States, a history that feels ever-present to individuals who still face stark racial disparities in the U.S. healthcare system. Once again, the city failed to prioritize cultural and linguistic competence and meaningful community engagement, relying instead on external contractors and agencies rather than utilizing local expertise and building community level capacity. Even though we know that just as community members have been more effective at convincing their neighbors to wear masks and adhere to social distancing, community members and organizations are more likely than outsiders to know how to listen to and answer their neighbors' legitimate concerns and convince their neighbors to get vaccinated. But it did not have to be like this. Myriad CBOs, safety nets providers, senior centers, and community members have offered to assist in ensuring that the pandemic response generally and vaccines specifically reach their communities. They've done so in testimony before this body, in CAB meetings, and in private and public letters to and meetings with DOHMH, H plus H, and City Hall. The city should finally take them up on their offer. The city's mistakes have cost countless lives and caused untold suffering. The city cannot undo this harm, but it can and it must change course going forward. A pandemic recovery that includes all of our communities depends on it. Thank you for the opportunity to testify and I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you so much. And thank you to this entire panel. Uh, we've received confirmation from the host that there are no additional registrants and seeing no hands raised, I'll now turn back to Chair Rivera for closing remarks and to gavel out the hearing.
I just want to thank everyone for being here today. I know we have come a long way since our vaccine shortage and which because of everything that we've gone through, it certainly feels a lot longer than just a few months ago. I think it's been made clear that we must ensure there's a high priority on New Yorkers who are most at risk, those who have been historically underserved, those who face uh, challenges in digital literacy who have good reason to mistrust our government because of our troubling medical history and of course because of how we serve low-income families and people of color. I want to thank the administration for being here and answering questions to the best of their ability and of course the community-based organizations who have gone above and beyond in every single moment in our history when it's been the most challenging to serve the people who need it the most. Uh, with that, I want to thank the entire council staff, um, every single person who made this hearing possible, and I look forward to our partnership with every single person who has participated today to make sure that we can make New York City, of course, a, a, a healthier place. Thank you so much. And with that, we adjourn this hearing.